the cardiac lecture. Uh, this is Diana Garrity, Professor Garrity, and I am here to teach you cardiac physiology and disorders, including everything that is listed on this slide. This is a 115 slide bank, but I am not going to read you the slide. I don't believe in reading slides. So we are going to do a fun activity with drawing first to introduce cardiac assessment and cardiac concepts. Um, and then I will probably start flowing through the PowerPoint a little bit, highlighting key points and drawing as we go along. This should be interactive. There will be some bookmarks along the bottom of this YouTube video, um, getting you to the bolded heading sections um, of hemodynamic monitoring, cardiac monitoring, myocardium disorders, endocardium, pericardium, cardiac procedures, and critical care pharmacology. Um, so you can hit step ahead if you want but what i am going to call say out is that you do need to listen and watch this drawing section of the video when you do move ahead in the bookmark there will be a few second disclaimer at the beginning of each section saying if you have not watched the drawing portion of this video here that you should come back and watch it this is where you are going to learn to understand the rest of the lecture is about learning to apply so in block four of um, our nursing program, you should be mostly learning to apply, but you cannot apply before you understand how things work. So for how things work, we are going to go over to a drawing page. Uh, this is probably something you are familiar in seeing. This is our thoracic cavity um, with the heart sitting behind the lungs. If you haven't seen anything um, close up, this is just something that I found on the internet that does show you where the heart sits in relation to the lungs. You can tell that the lungs completely surround the heart. So when the lungs are inflating and deflating, they are completely surrounding the heart. The heart is left in a hole in between the lung spaces. So we are going to be looking at the heart, which looks like one pump. That is one of our first fallacies of cardiac. There is no one pump. So when we remove the lungs from this position, you see a heart that looks like this. You may also see a heart that looks like this. We will be talking about the valves, the atrium, the ventricle, but I do not want you learning the heart like this because it doesn't show you really what the heart is doing. We want to look at the heart like this. Pull back a little bit. We're blowing the heart apart because the heart is actually like a sandwich. If I could take this picture and fold it in half across where the capillaries are, if we folded this picture half along this line, the hearts would go together. The hearts would go together and it would be one pump if we folded this paper in half. It would look like the heart we see over here and over here. But truly the heart is split apart into two pumps. This is the right pump, this is the left pump, and these are the lungs. We are going to redraw this so that you learn this. You can look at this picture till the day is done, but you are not going to understand what we are headed for until we draw it ourselves. So we're going to draw it ourselves. I'm going to have you pause here and go get a piece of paper, open up your drawing pads on your iPads or your phones, however you want to draw. Go get your favorite drawing implements, get a couple of color pens, pencils, crayons, markers on your drawing apps, however you want to do this, but we are going to draw. So come back here when you are ready to draw and we will get going. Did you know that you need to learn to learn something and to really have it stick in your memory? You need to hear something seven times. You will hear me repeat myself probably quite frequently. Sometimes I do it to remind myself where I am. Sometimes I do it because I forget. And sometimes it's because you need to hear something seven times. So if I am repeating something, it is probably something that you need to comprehend. All right, disclaimers aside, also a lot of these pictures that I am pulling are coming from the internet. They may be copyrighted. I am not claiming anyone's work. The only thing that I am claiming is my work is what I am drawing here in the lectures. Um, most of this is resources from the other 
of from the internet. I will be pulling on some of these internet pictures to explain concepts as we go along. Okay, I think that's all the disclaimers for this video. So let's get going into drawing. I'm gonna start with a crayon. Uh, let's start with a pen. And um, we're gonna start with a blue pen. I am gonna have you draw two sets of the same picture. I will tell you why in just a minute. So what we are going to do is we're gonna start with a V. So we're gonna draw two Vs. All right, we could do Vs, right? Everyone could draw a V. Off of that V, you're gonna draw what we're gonna call a vein, okay? Yay, Vs and veins, we got this. On top of this V, we are going to draw a circle. This circle, though, is gonna be comprised of two Cs, one C here and one C here. Um, in where those Cs connect, we're going to draw a circle, and here we're going to draw another vessel. So this is a vessel, a circle, circle, a V, and then I'm gonna draw a circle here. All right, I'm thinking that you might be able to figure this out. This is not an amazing drawing, but we are gonna do our two C's here, two C's here. That's a much better one. All right, so we got a vessel, we got a vessel, and we have our two circles here. So they might not look particularly identical. It kind of looks like a funky uh, flamingo or something, a bird, I don't know. Um, if you are a good artist or if you wanna redraw this later, by all means, the more you draw it, the more you'll get it. So that's done with the blue. We're gonna take the same pen or whatever pen you got um, and we're gonna change it to red. And on this side, we are going to draw the same thing, face in the opposite direction. We got a V. So let's draw two Vs. And then we've got a vessel coming off of that V. We got two Cs. So we're gonna draw a C up here and a C here. We're gonna draw a vessel coming into it. And when we're done with our Cs and our vessels, we're gonna draw the two circles where things are open. So we're gonna draw two Cs here and we're gonna have a vessel coming in and we're gonna have an opening and an opening. All right, so we've got like a bunch of birds looking at each other here. What we have drawn are two pictures of the right heart and the left heart. We're gonna divide them with a crayon line here crayon line. Okay, so let's label a few things on our two diagrams, and we're going to use these two diagrams to understand the heart. These silly looking beaky birds are really going to explain the heart to us. So let's label. Let's get a pen out, and uh, let's get a black pen so we can tell our labels apart. And what have we drawn here? Well, this is the veins returning to the heart. So what we have on here is we have an internal jugular coming down from the head. We have the inferior vena cava coming from the body, and we have the superior vena cava coming from the rest of the body. Doesn't matter if you know these names, I'm just giving you some info. So these veins are all dumping into, I'm sorry, this keeps moving. I don't wanna select anything. All these veins are dumping into what? What is this? This is the right atrium. Underneath the right atrium is the right ventricle. Blood will then flow out of the right ventricle. And where does this deoxygenated blood go? Where does it go, actually? We're gonna draw where it goes here with my little pen. Come here, pen. We are gonna draw where it's going. Let's not do green. Let's do a blue pen. It's going to go into tiny capillaries all around. So these are little capillaries. And it's going to go to the lungs. My lungs are what I'm going to draw in green. So the lungs are basically giant alveoli. And in these alveoli, capillaries run around the alveoli and exchange oxygen in the alveoli. So all the deoxygenated blood that comes through these capillaries then becomes oxygenated and flows back into the heart, to the second side of the heart. And what are we 
going into, in the second side of the heart, we're going into the left atrium and the left ventricle. And then where do we go out from there? To the body. Oops. Yeah, I'm not a very good, not a very good drawer. To the body. And this was to the lungs. So in return, and this is happening um, down here on the second. I'm going to show you. We're going to label the second one exactly the same way. We've got right atrium, right ventricle, to the lungs. You can draw the lungs again if you want, but I think we get the idea. Um, this is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. And this is out to the body. So we're just kind of repeating this. This is our second time. So you're now on your way to getting it. This is veins. All right, so we got our veins coming into the right atrium. I think everything's matching up there. Let's basically draw some blood going through this thing. The reason we're drawing two, and let me explain the madness here. Um, we are drawing two things. This is going to be diastole. And this is systole. The heart doesn't change. I think there's a couple of things we need to clear up before we start talking about diastole and systole. Um, you can also learn a whole lot of more anatomy here. I am not going to test you on internal jugular, inferior vena cava, subcavenia. None of these veins. I just want you to know that this is central venous circulation. Um, central venous circulation dumps right into the right atrium. There is no door to get into the heart. These little circles over here, these are valves. We're going to fill in their names in just a minute. I really need you, though, to get through the idea that the heart is two pumps. One side is deoxygenated blood. And this side is oxygenated. I draw like a pig. I'm so sorry. You guys are probably going to be doing beautiful drawings. Minor parable. Oxygenated. This is the deoxygenated side. This is the oxygenated side. This is before the lungs right. This is after the lungs left. Let me fill this in with a few more capillaries so my diagrams look the same. So we've got all our little capillaries going around the alveoli. What's going into the alveoli that um, causes this oxygenation? Air. We've got air going into these alveoli from the trachea. So air is entering in to those open alveoli and giving oxygen to the capillaries. So we have blood flow. So let's talk about the blood flow between the two differences between diastole and systole. The first time in diastole, We've heard that in diastole, the heart is at rest, and in systole, the heart is working. We're going to get rid of those ideas because they're not true. What you are going to call diastole is filling, and what you are going to call systole is emptying. Emptying? Okay. Uh, I can't spell. Um, um, Ing. Systole is emptying, diastole is filling. So in diastole, we are filling. The veins are returning blood to the right atrium at all times. But in diastole, the ventricles are filling from the atrium to the ventricle. And it's doing the same thing on the right side from the atrium to the ventricle. This is filling. So to do, oops, we don't want to put oxygenated blood in there. So to do this, the valves that we are in question here, the valves, which I wanted to color black, the valves here, some of them have to be open and some of them have to be closed. If we had both of them open, the blood that we're drawing here, the blood would fill the ventricle and also just passively fill here. 
There would be no pressure. It would just kind of dribble. It would dribble this way. There would be no pressure. There wouldn't be enough pressure to get it anywhere. It would maybe dribble, but that would be about it. So we can have both of these valves open because blood would just kind of fill to the top here and then just dribble out. There would be no propulsion to the left side, none at all. We need propulsion to push fluid around. We need a pump. Ooh, guess what the heart is. All right, so in order to pump, let me get rid of that blood going out because we don't want blood going out to the lungs yet. We want to fill the right ventricle. In order for blood to not go to the lungs, this valve has to be closed. We want the ventricle filled. We also don't want blood dribbling out into the body from the heart. We want these valves closed. The valves that let blood out of the heart to the lungs and the valve that lets blood out to the body are closed. The valves that are open in diastole and filling are the valves that are filling the ventricle, the valves between the atrium and the ventricle. So guess what we're gonna call these valves? We are gonna call these valves, and I'm gonna draw in a little, I'm gonna go in close up so you can see, and we're gonna name them. This one right here is called the tricuspid. This one right here is called the pulmonary. That's nice because it goes to the pulmonary system. We like that it's called pulmonary. The tricuspid, that one's gonna be hard to remember, but I'm gonna give you a little mnemonic. All right, this one over here, we only have to learn four. This one over here is mitral. And this one over here is aorta. You might hear my cat in the background because it's getting close to dinner time. All right, so we've named our four valves. We've got tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, and aorta. I'm going to give you a few definitions here. The tricuspid and the mitral are between something. The tricuspid and the mitral our AV valves. I'm gonna move down here for just a minute. We can go ahead and label them on our next picture too, so our second time. This is tricuspid. This is pulmonary. This one is mitral. And this one is aorta. So we've named our four valves. So let's take a look at what they're in between because we're gonna need to call these something. We're going to call the valves between, AV valves, are between the atrium and the ventricle. AV valves, makes sense. They're between the atrium and the ventricle, so they're named AV valves. Great, what are the AV valves? Let's go back and look at our picture. What are the AV valves between the atrium and the ventricle? On the right side, guess what it's called? Tricuspid. So the two AV valves are the tricuspid on the right and the mitral between the atrium and the ventricle on the left. So we have the tricuspid and the mitral. I'm gonna scoot these little icons out of the way because I gotta draw. Get out, get out, get out. Perfect. All right, so we've got the AV valves are between the atrium and the ventricle. They are named tricuspid and mitral. So then we have another set of valves that are called outflow valves. They're the valves controlling outflow. Oops. Outflow valves. So let's go back to our drawing and decide which ones are controlling outflow. Which ones are controlling outflow? Well, the one flowing out to the pulmonary and the one flowing out to the aorta. So our outflow valves on the right side, we have a pulmonary 
And on the left side, we have an aorta. That's where those valves are going. That's what they're named for. It's the one nice thing they did for students is they named those valves pulmonary and aorta. Get out of here. All right, so we have named our valves and we are starting to figure out what they're doing. I have a little hint for you, for those of you that like monomics. If you want to remember which ones are on which side, TP and MA. TP, MA. Just imagine your kid upstairs looking for toilet paper. He needs it. TP, MA. TP are on the right. MA is on the left. So TP, MA. If you can remember T, P, MA, you will immediately know what side of the heart this is on. There is a reason I am doing this. I swear, there is a reason you are drawing scribbles like this. We are learning the anatomy of the heart, but we're also learning how this anatomy affects different parts of the body and why we see the symptoms we see when we have heart failure, when we have valve problems, you will not have to memorize a list. You can look back at your picture of the heart and just understand how it works and how we get symptoms. So let's finish our diastole and systole. We talked about that diastole is filling. This is when the atriums are filling the ventricle. So during diastole, this is all that's happening. It's passive, there's not a lot of complicated stuff going on. Just blood is draining from the veins into the right atrium and right ventricle. Blood is draining from the lugs into the left A and the left ventricle. What happens to get blood fully into the ventricle is that this atrium needs to eject. Oop. Let's go. Oh no, go back. This atrium needs to eject. So we are going to take, ugh, Lord have mercy, I need to learn how to do my pictures. Okay. We need to do something to get this atrium to eject blood into the ventricle. So right at the end of diastole, when filling is done and this ventricle is almost empty, and we have cleaned out the blood from the atrium. There may be still a little bit dribbling back in from the veins, but the atrium has contracted its fluid all the way into the ventricle, okay? Same thing is happening on the left side. It's dribbling back in, but the atrium has contracted, pushing all the blood flow into that left ventricle. So what I am gonna do is draw the blood in the left ventricle. So at the end of diastole, the ventricles have filled and all that's left in the atrium is a little bit of blood dribbling in from the next time. At the end of diastole, systole starts. So once these ventricles have filled and stretched, all of a sudden the valves flop. We're gonna to move to the systole drawing. At the end of diastole, at the beginning of systole, this valve closes, this valve closes. The AV valves close and the pulmonary and aortic valves are open. So you close off these valves. What's left in here? Well, we said, oops, that's the wrong color. The right side of the heart is blue. So all of this blood is in here. The right side is red. All of this blood is in here. That can't get back this way. Nothing can get back into the atrium so that during systole, the ventricles empty. And during emptying, woof, the ventricles eject and blood goes out to the body and blood goes out to the lungs. The valves that were holding the stuff out of the outflow areas are now open and 
the ventricle ejects. So in systole, the ventricle is squeezing and ejecting and blood is going to the lungs and to the body. So do we see the difference between diastole and systole? In diastole, what is happening? The right atrium fills and it just drops into the right ventricle. So as this stuff dribbles in and starts filling up, it just continues to drop into the ventricle. As the lung is getting oxygenated, everything is filling. So filling is always happening in the heart because this is, oops, these are still continuing to fill. There's still stuff coming in here during systole while this is getting ejected. But this atriums are always filling. Atriums are always filling. There's no doors into the atriums. The atriums are always filling. So when a systole is done and these ventricles have squeezed all this blood out at the end of systole we have no blood left in the ventricles all the blood has gotten into the lungs and to the body and then it starts again the aortic and pulmonary shut and the av valves open and filling starts again do we understand that concept? If not, you can go back and listen to it again. Um, this is what your systole and diastole drawing should be looking like so that you can understand what is going on in the body. So I am going to now add on one more piece of information. So you have these pictures. We can see that, let me put diastole back together. We're going to be having in diastole, right ventricular filling and left ventricular filling. And then in systole, we have right ventricular ejection and right ventricular ejection. So we are ejecting the ventricles in systole. We are filling them during diastole. So there's no heart rest or anything like that because we can see during the quote rest time of diastole the atrium contracts to get the rest of that fluid out of there into the ventricle to finish filling the ventricle so diastole is all about filling and part of filling is squeezing the atrium to fill the ventricle remember these ventricles and these atriums are like sponges they squeeze they kind of squeeze to get the blood into the ventricle. So they will squeeze at the end of diastole and fill the ventricle, and then the AV valve slams shut, the aortic and pulmonic valves open, and then the ventricles get to squeeze. They squeeze all the blood out to the body and to the lungs. So first concept, diastole is filling and atrial ejection. Systole is ventricular emptying only, and it is very short. So take a break, mull over that for a second, maybe redraw your pictures to make it make sense. Go back, listen again. You draw your pictures however you want, but I want your pictures to include in diastole, right diastole and filling, draw your right heart, your left heart, and I want your valves in the proper position. In diastole, the AV valves, mitral and tricuspid are open. In the diastole, AV valves are open. The AV valves, if you forgot, are tricuspid and mitral. The outflow valves are pulmonary and aorta, okay? So I want you to redraw these. I want you to make them as nice as you want. Um, this is how I ended up drawing mine. Oh, I can't find my Notability app. I'll go back and find it later. Um, anyway, this is, make it pretty. Make it what you want. Um, but it's a right heart and a left heart. There are two pumps in one in your heart. So how does the heart know to do all this? We're gonna add a couple of more things. So hopefully you all have understood, you've gotten your stuff all together and you're like, yeah, I got blood flow from the veins to the right atrium, 
through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, out the pulmonary valve to the lungs. It gets oxygenated in the lungs, and then it drips back into the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve to the left ventricle, and then goes out the aortic valve to the aorta to the body. Okay, we got systole, diastole. We are happy. The next thing we need to figure out to put on here is how does this all get coordinated? Who's in charge of this? Electricity is in charge of this. I may have to um, clean up my drawing a whiff to help finish this. But what we're gonna do is I'm gonna come over here for a second and just get some clean space here. And I'm going to draw you, oh, what color can I use? Let's use, let's use something magenta-y. Okay, I am going to draw a picture for you that's gonna look probably pretty familiar. What is that? We know what that is. That's an EKG. How are we gonna connect this EKG to this mess we drew over here? Well, I'll tell you what. In fact, in order to draw this EKG, let me just, I'm gonna trash this one, I'm gonna draw better. I don't think you could ever look at one beat and call it an EKG. So we're gonna draw multiple beats. Oops, messed that one up. Oh, I took care of the whole thing. Oh, see, you can't mess this up too bad. Look at how I'm doing. That one got really big, didn't it? <laughs> All right, what have I drawn here? What in the world have I drawn here? I've drawn an EKG. It's not very good. It's not, they're not really bad, but it's not really good either. Okay, so what have we have on this EKG? Let's define this. You can see we're going through the whole PowerPoint. We're just doing it different. We have a P wave. We have a QRS wave. We have a T wave. Then we have another P wave, and another QRS, and a T. Then we have another P wave, another really tall QRS, doesn't matter, and a T, and a P wave, and a QRS that looks a little wonky, and a T. This is what we should have. We should have P's, QRS's, and T's. That's the way our EKG looks. But what does it mean? What does it mean? What does all this mean? And how does it connect to the mess over here. Well, I'll tell you what. To this mess over here, we're gonna add, oops, no, not the eraser, go back. Um, let's, let's actually clean up our ventricles and stuff so we can, it doesn't look so messy. Um, just for the teaching points. You don't have to clean yours up. Um, I just wanna clean mine up. It just looks too messy over here. I'm gonna just get rid of all this. Cause you named them all. You can look at yours. I'm just getting rid of all this cause ugh, gross. Look how messy this is. Um, mm, do, 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 get rid of all this. Junk, 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 junk. So messy. Okay. It would help if I didn't, uh, didn't use the, okay. So now we've put everything back. Oh no, we lost a valve, our pulmonary valve. Okay, let's go back to this. And it, to explain the EKG part, I'm gonna draw that in the same EKG colors. Up here at the top, we have something called the SA node. This is a pacemaker node. This is an area of cells that are in charge of determining the heart rate. They are innervated by the parasympathetic system. 
the vagal system, and the sympathetic system. I'm not going to write all that. Sympathetic. Okay. You know what I'm saying. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. The SA node is innervated by those and they are controlling the heart rate. The SA node controls the heart rate. At the bottom of the atrium and ventricle, and this is on both sides of the heart, because remember, this heart, if we put this together and folded this page in half, this side would match with this side, this side would match with this side. So basically, the SA node sits at the top of both atriums and at the bottom of both atriums. This is an SA, and this node at the bottom is the AV. Hey, it sits at the atrial ventricle, and they named it the right. So it's right next to an AV valve. Woo! I love when things make sense. So we have our um, tricuspid, we have our mitral, we have our pulmonary, and we have our aortic there. These SA nodes are in charge of creating um, this electrical energy and creating the EKG. So what happens here is the SA node goes, well, let me go back to our EKG color. The SA node will say, let's go. And it sends an electrical message down to the AV node, goes all around the atrium to the AV node. The same thing happens on the left ventricle. Same time, they, the SA node lets go and it goes around the right and the left ventricles through the same time. That, from the SA node, this is the SA, this is the AV. The energy moving from the SA to the AV node is noted on your EKG as a P wave. Then it stalls in the AV node, okay? So basically, we can write on here, this is from the SA node, this is where it sits in the AV node. During the time the electricity is sitting in the SA and AV node, let me just make that smaller so we can actually see it. SA node, AV node. This is the electricity moving. Boo, makes a P wave. Then it just kind of stalls and sits in the AV node. Let's go back to our drawing over here. When it stalls and sits in the AV node, that's when the atrium contracts. You have to have electricity before you have contraction. So as that electricity moves from the SA node around to the AV node, that is signaling those atrial muscles to get ready to contract. Electricities cause contractions. So the electricity moves around the atriums, and as soon as the electricity gets to the AV node, the atriums contract. So the atriums will contract on this flat line. So during that flat line after the P wave, your atriums are contracting, okay? That right there, after those atriums contract, what then happens? After these atriums contract, and fill the ventricles. So we're gonna fill these ventricles again. After the AV node tracts and fills these ventricles, squished all the fluid out of there into these ventricles. This is the red one. This is oxygenated blood. But the left atrium squeezed all the oxygenated blood it had into the left ventricle. So both ventricles are full. What happens next? When the ventricles are full, they're ready to eject, but we have to change the valves because if the ventricles eject now, everything's going back the wrong way. We have to shut the AV valves. And so at the end of the atrium's contracting, I'm gonna draw this on the EKG. We're gonna draw a line here. After these atriums contract, we hear the word, the sound lub because this is the sound of the AV valves closing. So we have lub. Okay, so now we're starting to see a picture here. We are coordinating the EKG with what's going on in the heart. This is electricity moving around. This is atrial contraction. 
and then you don't see it on the EKG at all. You just hear a sound, and the sound is called lub. That means that your valves have done their switch. The AV valves have shut, and the outflow valves are open. So then what happens is now we go back to our electricity. Let me get my electricity color. Where did the electricity color go? This was it. All right, so we have an electricity problem now. We got the electricity sitting in these AV nodes over here. Now, after the valves have connected, so let's put our SA nodes, because now we're going into systole. Here's our nodes again. And we are going into systole. So where is the electricity when these valves shut? Was in the AV node. But now the AV node's gonna send out electricity to the ventricle. And that electricity going around a big muscle there from the AV node around is called the QRS. So the QRS, let's write some words over here that make some sense. So I'm going to tell you that the P wave, what did the P wave mean again? Atrial conduction. Then the PQ line is atrial contraction and electricity in AV node. I guess I should say that the start of the P wave is electricity from SA gets conducted around the atrium. That's the P wave. Then we have that PQ flat line that's atrial contraction, the electricity sitting in the AV node. It has to sit there while the atrium contracts. Then the valves change. Lub. And we move into systole. So when those valves close and make the noise lub, then we have the QRS. And what does the QRS mean? It means electricity leaves AV node and travels around the ventricle. So what these P's and QRS's is, is we are watching electricity traveling around. During the P wave, we're watching electricity travel around the atrium. And during the QRS wave, we're watching electricity travel around the ventricle. So atrial and ventricle, the QRS means ventricle, the P wave means atrial. This is gonna be important when we do our um, EKGs. So P wave means atrial, QRS means ventricle conduction. Um, we'll talk again about systole and diastole. So after the QRS, what do we have here? We've got the QRS and we have a little flat line after the QRS right there. That is called the ST segment and like the ventricle, we have the PQ line. I guess you could call it a PQ segment if you wanted to. I don't know what to really call it. But that PQ line segment means atrial contraction. What do you think the ST line or segment means? This guy right here. It means ventricular contraction. So we have a P wave, which means atrial contraction. We have the QRS means ventricle electricity. And then the ST segment is, okay, I gotta say that again, because I messed it up. The P wave means electricity running around the atrium. P wave, electricity around the atrium. The PQ segment means atrial contraction. 
the valves will then close. And while the valves are making their switch, the QRS is now the electricity leaving the anode and traveling around the ventricle. So the QRS and the P wave are electricity movement. There's no contraction going on during this time. The contractions happen during the flat parts of the EKG. The atrial contraction is during the PQ segment. The ventricular contraction is during the ST segment. Then the T wave, what's going on with the T wave? Are we moving electricity anywhere? We're just gonna call the T wave reset. And that is something where the electricity all um, resets to its original levels. The electricity is traveling using potassium, calcium, sodium, and magnesium. Um, potassium, calcium, sodium, and magnesium are the most common cardiac electrolytes, sodium being the first one. But it's the sodium-potassium pump that moves this QRS and this P wave around. We need good electrolytes to have good EKG conduction. But I want to point out the important things about the P wave and the QRS wave is that this is where we can see how well electricity is making it around the heart. And we need this electricity to stimulate a contraction. So after the P wave, we get a atrial contraction. After the QRS, we get a ventricular contraction. Then we have a little T wave, which is basically everything reset, and then we go into it again. I did not mention after we have, where do the valves close and reset again? We have our lub, but where is our dub? Where does the dub happen? Well, we have to let, we have to have those outflow valves open during systole, right? Everything needs to go out of the ventricle to the lungs and to the body. So those outflow valves here, these outflow valves have to be open. When do they shut? When will the outflow valve shut? After the ventricle ejects. So where in the QRS would we go looking to hear the, the sound dub? Well, I said they got to stay open until after ventricular contraction. So right here, after ventricular contraction is dub, and that means the outflow valves close. So we are looking at this EKG. Boy, we're drawn everywhere. Let's go back to this EKG where we haven't drawn anything. What does the P wave stand for? Atrial electricity. I can't spell. Just going to get rid of that fact that I can't spell on national TV here. Atrial electricity from... SA to AV. Then we have atrial contraction. Then we have lub because we can't shut those AV valves until the atria is contracted. So lub happens here. While lub is going on, the AV node sends out the QRS. So this is ventricle electricity from AV node. So it leaves the AV node, goes all around the ventricle. And then we have this flat part is ventricle contraction. And then after ventricle contraction is dub. Guess what lub dub also indicate? What happens here is we have atrial contraction and this is closing. This is ventricle electricity and ejection. So this right here is your drawing systole. This 
rest of the EKG until the next systole is diastole. So diastole includes the T wave, the resetting process here, the new atrial conduction and atrial contraction. So that is all diastole. This is all systole. So when we look at the EKG, the only time we are seeing any systole is from the QRS to the end of the ST segment. That's systole, the rest of it, the T, the P, and there, all the way to the QRS is diastole. And then from the QRS to the end of that line is systole. And each time we have these lines here, these lines that end diastole and end systole, those lines are lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2. So when you hear lup dub, lup dub, lup dub, you are hearing valves shut. The lubs are the AV valves closing. The dubs are the outflow valves closing. So when the AV valves close at the end of diastole, you start systole. Dub means the end of systole. Lub means the end of diastole. Lup dub, lup dub. Systole and diastole, systole and diastole over and over and over again. Okay, I think that's enough concepts. This is basically what we have done at the beginning. We have done blood flow. We've named our valves. We have talked about where everything sits on the EKG and where the lub dub sounds come from. So the closing of the AV valves leads to lub. The closing of the outflow valves leads to dub. Um, the P wave is atrial conduction. The PQ segment is atrial contraction. Then the end of diastole when the AV valves close. The QRS is electricity going around the ventricle. And then the ST segment is ventricle conduction. And then we have dub, where the outflow valves close after the, the ventricles have ejected. And we go back into diastole, where the ventricles fill. So diastole is filling, systole is emptying. And now we know what the valves' names are, what they do, and how they fit to the EKG. I want you to stop I here. You took a break uh, for the portion now. You got a lot of information with all the drawing, and we're going to start trying to put that together here. So we are on um, the first slide of the slide deck. Again, I am not going to read your slides. Um, I'm going to go through and making sure that we understand the concepts because that is really going to make your intervention so much easier. The disorders are um, organized under the remit format, recognizing cues, recognizing worsening cues, priority patients, when to call the doctor is during worsening cues. And then we have interventions where we are actually intervening on the patient. Some interventions become more prioritized when the patient is symptomatic and some are just monitoring uh, and teaching the patient about their disorder, what the causes of the disorder and how to prevent it in the future. This is really important in heart failure. Uh, so let's get going here. We're going into the cardiac concepts. Hey, doesn't this look familiar? The right heart and the left heart. Welcome back, right heart and left heart. Now we're going to introduce the, um, the three layers of the heart. You're going to see a little pen here. I do love pens, and I actually love when I can record because I can actually zoom in to the concepts here. Let me shut off my pen. I can actually zoom in way better than I can in the classroom, and I can see that I made a big mess. I also have a whiteboard, so we're going to be having some fun. All right, the three layers of the heart that we're going to talk about disorders are are the endocardium. Endo means endo heart. <laughs> no, that's not funny. I know, not funny at all. Um, this is the uh, sorry. Clear all that. 
I'm still learning how to use this pen, this, uh, this thing here, and obviously not doing very well with it. All right, the endocardium, just ignore that last, just ignore that last thing. The endocardium is endo heart, and it is the inside lining, a very thin, clear, um, almost paper-like tissue, um, white in color, uh, and it is protecting the muscle, and it actually creates the valves. This is all the endocardium, a very thin tissue layer over the muscle, and it actually forms the inner lining of all the vessels and the valves. So this is the endocardium of the heart, and it is around the inside of the atrium, inside of the ventricles, and all around the inside of the blood vessels. This is going to be important because these will be your blood vessel disorders, your valve disorders, and um, infections of the inside lining of the heart. The myocardium is going to be, let's make it orange. The myocardium, and that's what this was supposed to be. There you go. Erase the mistake. Is the actual contracting muscle of the heart. So you can see how it's all striated. It is smooth muscle. Um, actually, sorry. I, you know, I don't actually know. I shouldn't say that. I don't know. It's skeletal muscle. Um, but anyway, it is contracting muscle. I think it's just honestly heart muscle. It's its own unique muscle. Um, and this is contracting muscle. It also conducts electricity. That's why I'm coloring it yellow. Ooh, we can color it maybe a little bit of red, white on the inside. It conducts electricity. This myocardium conducts electricity all around and um, then contracts. So it's a conductor. And it's a, um, a conductor and a contractor. So the myocardium is the actual functional part of the heart and the squeezing part of the heart. Um, the, we don't really, we're not going to talk about the epicardium. That's just an outside layer that is kind of like the endocardium. There's really no disorders of it because we bunch those together with the pericardium. Because the, if I could draw... Let's do those in black. The endocardium would be the little, I'm going to kind of exaggerate this. The endocardium would be the thin tissue layer on the outside, protecting the outside of the muscle because the muscle needs to be sandwiched in some kind of nice soft, um, kind of like a rice paper for a sushi roll or something. Anyway, so we're always protecting the muscle with these little thin tissue papers, um, the epicardium and the endocardium. But the epicardium disorders usually spill into the pericardium, which I'm going to draw around here a little bigger than usual. It is the thin paper-like sac around the heart that there is a little whiff of pericardial fluid in there just to keep the heart cushioned. That's kind of like your amniotic sac for your heart. Um, so the pericardium is there. So if your endocardium is having uh, problems or gets, you know, an irritation, it will, uh, it will affect the pericardial space. Um, but the pericardium is the thin layer of tissue on the outside and the pericardial space is in there. So um, we might come back to this slide to take a look at things. Um, but this is the three layers of the heart that are the disorders that we're going to be talking about. Moving on, this is refresh from the drawing, and I'm not gonna go over it again. It's just some people like things in tables, some things like some in drawings. Um, so that's just review. This is also review. We already went over this as well. We went over the valves, when they were open, when they were closed. This is for people who like lists and like looking at lists. Um, so this is here for you. But really, I think you get it all from the drawing. And when you're doing that, you're, you're studying here. Uh, let's go into some concepts. The concepts are important. Uh, we have three concepts that rule the heart. Three concepts rule the heart, keep the heart functioning, stimulate the heart to do different things, and they are preload, afterload, and contractility. So we're going to talk about all three of those and how we can assess for the three major things that affect the heart. Preload, afterload, and contractility. The three things that affect the heart are preload, two, afterload, Pre and post. I don't know why they call it post load. Preload, afterload, and contract. 
ductility. We can go into a lot of math on that, but you know, not really a big uh, math person. But we are going to be affecting all three of these things. When our heart does not work, we are going to have to step in and help manage preload, afterload, and contractility. So these are going to be the three things that we intervene and that we give medications for. So we un to understand these concepts in order to understand why we are doing the things that we are doing. All right. So preload is the amount of fluid. Seriously, preload. You look at the fluid. It is the amount of fluid in the... I don't know why I think this is the clear. Um, the amount of fluid in the blood vessels pre-heart. This just really means... And I don't know why I didn't... And let's, let's blow up on this picture of the heart here. Um, this is where you read... Or if you could read, we can read, what is going on in the heart. And the only way we can read what's going on in the heart is with a catheter that is sitting in the right atrium. This is a central line catheter. The catheter can be inserted into the subclavians. The, um, uh, I wanted to make this blue. Blue, because it's a vein. Um, this kind of etches out this way. We also have veins coming in this way and from up at the bottom here. Uh, this is, you can put a catheter in here. You could, the picks come from up here, but they all end somewhere in here. And that is the right atrium. We are measuring preload here because this is how much blood is returning to the heart. It's kind of like, you know, how much do you have to deal with in there? How much can this heart pump through is how much fluid we have in our body because the heart has to deal with it. So that's really where we measure and look at preload, the amount of fluid. So it is going to be a fluid measurement in the blood vessels pre-heart. So why do we measure the things that we measure? Let's go back down to this drawing. Let me clear it actually. I don't know why I still think that's clear. All right, so if we have blood, let's just say something happens to this valve and uh, it's just stenosed, it's not working. We can't get anything past there. It's obstructed. Blood's still returning, blood's still returning. Blood's still returning. Where is it going to go? I don't know. It's just going to keep backing up because it can't go anywhere. So it is backing up all down the inferior vena cava, all back into the peripheral circulation, all down to the leg circulation, all up to the jugular vein circulation coming out of the head. We've got fluid backing up. It can't get through. There maybe is a little bit getting through here. Maybe a little bit. And if a little bit gets through, it will circulate through and it will go back into the, into the left atrium and out to the aorta, to the body. But it's not as much as what's backed up back there. An obstruction in the right heart or in the lungs is going to cause fluid backup. So what are our symptoms when we back up into the jugular vein? We will get jugular vein distension because if there is fluid backing up enough to poke out that blood vessel, there's, it's not getting back into the heart. Jugular venous distension. What are we going to see if fluid is backing up? These go to the arms. This goes down to the liver, the GI system, lower legs. What do you think it's going to back up to? The liver, the GI system the lower legs, because this is going to back up. This is causing a big backup in the system. Uh, this is why you cut hepatosplenomegaly. You have, this is the spleen, the GI system. You might end up with varices. Uh, you might get peripheral edema. Anywhere fluid can get out of this congested system, it will. So this is what's going on in the venous system. And remember, we still have an arterial system. We still got to circulate. 
So we're going back to the arterial system and look at what we've got trickling out here. So what other symptoms are we looking for from the arterial system? We are looking at decreased blood flow. We are looking at decreased pulses, decreased O2. Why decreased O2? The blood that's getting into the lungs and then back through, it's fully oxygenated. Why the low O2? It's fully oxygenated. There's just not enough of it to supply the whole body. So decrease in oxygenation. Then what happens with decreased in oxygenation? The brain says, I'm not getting enough oxygen. So it says, breathe faster. Because, hey, I'm going to do my part. Let's get the respiratory rate up and bring in more oxygen. It doesn't help because there's still not that much blood flow coming through. So we've increased our respiratory rate. So it tells the heart, you know what? Obviously, you need to work a little harder because all your all you're shooting out here is just a dribble. Why don't you uh, increase that heart rate and try to see what you can do there? So in this little discussion, we have done every single sign and symptom of right heart failure. You're welcome. That slide's coming up. But we just did every single symptom of right heart failure by discussing preload. The preload is what we are trying to measure when we put in the central line catheter. We can regular, oh, look, it's just what we talked about, jugular venous distension. If we see it, there's too much preload. Um, extremity edema, if you see it, there's too much preload. What do we have for if you don't have enough preload? What do we have for decreased preload? What are some of our symptoms or our cues of decreased preload? Gonna give you a minute to think. Increased preload is jugular venous distension, extremity edema for this reason. Everything's backing up. And even if there's something wrong in the left heart, which we will talk about, I will take this picture and talk about left heart failure. Um, I'm just skipping ahead into the failures. Um, in the right heart, left heart failure, um, it will back all the way up through the lung vasculature and back into the right heart if it's severe enough. But that's overload. What about underload? It's the remember from first block, dry mucous membranes. Along with decreased blood flow because you're just dry. So sometimes we don't know if someone, oh, so decreased blood flow, decreased O2, decreased pulses, increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate. This would be decreased preload or dry. Decreased preload is dry. Increased preload is distended. So look at all the same thing. We still have dry blood flow. So I don't know if my patient's dry or his heart doesn't work. Which one is the problem? I'm seeing this. Both of these are showing me that it could be some preload problem or it could be a dehydration problem. They look the same. But in a dry patient, the muc I mean, in an overloaded patient, this patient down here, what would their mucous membranes look like? They'd be wet because this patient's overloaded with fluid. The heart can't even deal with it. This patient's mucous membranes would not be dry, not be dehydrated. This one would have dry mucous membranes. The other thing we would look at is JVD. A dehydrated patient would have no JVD, no edema, dry mucous membranes. We can put the, the decreased blood flow, decreased OTQ, decreased pulses. Those cues go with preload because we needed more information. You can't just memorize a list of cues and know where it goes because if you had those boxed cues, they would, you'd have to need more assessments to figure out what was going on. But preload is the amount of fluid in the system. And that's why I like to use the CVP as a gas tank. Because remember, if we want to measure it, the CVP needs to be in a line that ends in central circulation so we can measure it. We hook this central line up to a hemodynamic catheter. I will explain that in a minute. And that will give us something on the monitor. Let me uh, get to it. 
to here, this right here, is a CVP tracing on the monitor, this um, green thing. Let me see if I can get the uh, eraser working here. There it goes. I got it. So that was the uh, CVP the, on the uh, monitor there. And when you read the number, I'm going to look at the number that's right here. What is this number right here? This CVP, it's the blue number. It says CVP, is 15. Let's go over to our gas tank and look at our gas tank. A normal CVP is 4 to 12. Well, which one is it, 4 or 12? Well, when you wake up in the morning and you maybe forgot to drink the night before, maybe you went out, you had a good time, uh, you're a little dehydrated this morning, um, your CVP is on the low side. But if your CVP is 4, it's still adequate. If it's below 4, you might have a headache, you might be a little dehydrated, probably haven't peed in a while, maybe you diureased a little bit. Anyway, your CVP is super low. If we can put a, a line in there that tells us exactly what your preload is, we know how fluid overloaded you are. We know if you have a problem with your heart. We know if you have a problem with dehydration. We use it all the time in the ICU to make sure patients are adequately fluid resuscitated. Um, so a normal, normally we walk through the day, maybe you drink enough, maybe you forget to drink your water bottle or something. Your CVP could range anywhere from four to eight. Um, you drink all your water bottles and you're doing a great job with yourself. Your CVP is probably around eight to 12. But if you're starting to have problems with your kidneys um, or your heart's increasing its preload because it can't handle all the fluid, then you are considered overload. So those are the numbers for CVP and understanding CVP. Um, let's get rid of those. So that is a preload. Let's go to the next slide is afterload. Well, afterload is the after what the heart has to push against. So this is a great picture. I mean, it's cute and it's simplistic, but um, afterload is what's after the heart. So preloads, what's going into the heart, and we decide overload, free, you know, overload or underload or too dry. And afterload is the resistance going on in the heart. So this guy here, afterload. If we have restriction to the heart ejecting, it's going to cause that heart to do what? What's going to be problem with ejecting? What is going to happen? Where's the fluid going to build up? If it can't get out, where is the fluid going to build up? It can't get out. 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 It's going to build up and go backwards. If we took a look at where our left heart goes back to, because this is a simplistic picture, if this was our left heart backing up and backing up and backing up, backing up, backing up, the heart has two choices here. It can get stronger and pump it out, which is what a lot of hearts do. Or if it's kind of weak to begin with and you're not a good exerciser and you're not getting heart muscle, it will distend and swell to fill up and fill up with this backup. But when it distends and swells, the wall gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Anyway, we're going to go through all these words in a minute. But afterload is the resistance the heart pumps against. The arterial resistance, we are assuming, when you take your blood pressure, are you looking at an artery or a vein? It's an artery, right? So as you are taking your blood pressure, we are looking at an artery that just came off the aorta. When the aorta comes out of the heart, let's talk about the aorta for a minute. Um, when the aorta comes out of the heart, I'm just going to draw the, um, this is our big giant aorta. This is it leaving the left ventricle. There are a couple of things that it does. So here's, it has three branches right at the top of the arch and goes down. But right here is something called the coronary science, sinus coronary sinus. That coronary sinus is the blood flow to the outside of the heart. These are um, the left main artery. So this is the heart feeds itself first. At least it took care of itself and started feeding itself first. So the first blood out of the aorta goes to the coronary sinus, the coronary sinus to feed itself. So once it goes out of the aorta, then it hits these two pathways. So it's 
flying out of the aorta. It's going to get shoved up into these arteries. Where do those arteries go? To the brain. Feeds the brain second, so it's feeding itself. And then the next place it goes is up here. And then it starts heading down the thoracic aorta. But this little branch over here goes to the right arm. And so that's why there's maybe in patients that are having problems with their aorta, you may find a difference between their right arm pressure and their left arm pressure because there is this little extra loop here that goes down and out to the brachials. So um, that's a little bit about the aorta. I think that's important here because the aorta is the main blood artery that we are reading for afterload because it's the main artery outside the heart. So because this stuff is going out to the brachial artery, we are getting a pretty good reflection of our pressures in the aorta and what it looks like, what the resistance looks like to the heart. So I will tell you, you have a great way to measure afterload and it is the diastolic blood pressure. The number at the bottom there this is everything. There's a huge difference between this number and this number. This number would make me very, very worried more than this number. And I'll tell you why. This is our normal diastolic. The blood vessel looks great. This is, um, so this is the normal blood pressure. This is the way that the heart wants it to be, a normal diastolic and normal resistance. With every, it is designed that with normal resistance, this is filled, but not filled too much. If it fills too much, it will push against the walls of these arteries and say, I have too much pressure in there, and the vessel should vasodilate to fill that space. The body tries to keep its own balance. When we are seeing high diastolic pressures, high diastolic pressures, these are pressures in the 90s, 100s. So I'm talking about 120 over 90 or 120 over, and it doesn't even have to be 120. Let's say 180 over 90, 180 over 100, 180 over 120. These are severely tight vessels. That means they're vasoconstricted and the pressure in there is so high, these could bulge or burst. So this is actually pretty dangerous. Um, I'm getting a little bit too wild here. I think I need to erase some things. Come here, give me my eraser. I said I was just too wild. Give me the eraser. Hmm. Okay, it's not letting me race. All right, well, anyway, too high, too resistant. Think about a poor little heart trying to pump out. Oh, now it's starting to erase. I think I just got too much stuff here. Too many drawings. We'll just, we'll just clear it. Still don't know why I think that's clear. Guys, sometimes I'm just a mess. All right, so normal diastolic. This means normal afterload. The heart doesn't have to push against too much. The heart's real happy. This is high resistance. The heart has to push real out real hard. This makes the heart real sad. Nobody likes vasoconstriction because it has to push really hard, and it's just too sad. It's like, oh, I'm like Sisyphus trying to push a rock up the hill. I either need to swell and get swollen, or I need to dilate. This isn't working. Um, and then this right here, vasodilation, low resistance. You think that would be great for the heart? So I'm... I'm going to draw these little hearts. They're pushing real hard. Those are the little heart hands. They're pushing real hard. They just can't push any harder, those poor little guys. And they're going to get tired. They're going to get tired of this. So in vasodilation, you'd think they'd be real happy, right? No, they got to work harder because now these little hearts have to fill a sewer pipe. They got to work real hard to get enough fluid. They got to pump real hard to get enough fluid to fill the sewer pipe. So they're either meeting resistance and they're getting tired or they're getting tired by trying to fill a hole that can never be filled. 
It's like filling a sewer pipe. They're throwing buckets of water into an empty well. It's exhausting. They're never going to fill it. Vasodilation and vasoconstriction make a really sad heart. So we don't want vasodilation and vasoconstriction. And that is why I am a little bit more worried about a heart that is pumping out into a systolic. You may be like, well, they got 120. They're doing just fine. What the heck is going on here? What is 40 telling you? He's vasodilated. He's super vasodilated. It's, there's something wrong. Why is the vessel that vasodilated? Did we give too much vasodilator? Is there something going on causing vasodilation? I will tell you, sepsis is a big cause of vasodilator. You go into the ICU, you will have patients with diastolics in the 30s, 40s. These patients have sewer pipes. Of course, their hearts are unhappy. Um, and patients that have blood pressures of 180 over 98, you know this is not good. That's bad too. That's vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation, we try to avoid at all costs in the heart unit. So take a look the next time you go in there. Look at your contractility. Dose. Then we had preload, which is fluid in, afterload, fluid out, resistance out. Contractility is the actual strength of the heart muscle. For this one, I'm just going to pull up here. You can see these little cartoon hearts. This one's weak and this one's strong, just in case you couldn't figure it out. But look what the weak guy is doing. He's sending out weak, thready, small amounts. These are not enough. Not enough O2. This one is strong bounding. So guess what we're describing? Weak, thready, strong, bounding. Yeah, you're right. Pulses. So contractility, we can measure it by pulses. Really, that is the simplest way. That's why we spend so much time checking pulses. Always check your pedal pulses. Don't you want to know if you're circulating to your feet? I always want to know if I'm circulating to my feet. I'm not talking about skin temperature. Sometimes people have cold feet. I have cold feet, but my pulses are still there. So always check those pedal pulses. Always be looking for edema in the pedal areas. Heart nurses are always looking for edema in pulses. Always, always, always. So touch those feet. Look at those feet. Um, make sure you look for cap refill as well. That's a good sign that you are um, perfusing, cap refill, great sign. And also the skin temperature, like I said, people can have cold feet and cold hands, just means they have a warm heart. So um, check those pulses, check those feet. When you're checking your pulses, you're checking for edema. When you're doing cap refill, you can do an edema check, check your feet, pulses, contractility. You can also do skin warmth and color and cap refill, like I said. So your skin assessment, touch the feet, you've touched the heart. Okay, enough. That was cheesy. Um, if we want to do advanced, we can actually put one of these big old fancy yellow things. If you happen to do your ICU and your rotation in a CVICU, you may see these big old yellow things. They are big old long catheters. They go in through the subclavian artery. They will drop in. They can go in through the subclavian artery or through the jugular, and they drop into the right ventricle. Yes, in through the ventricle, and then they drop into the pulmonary artery, and they stop in the pulmonary artery. Oh, my gosh, that could cause an occlusion, right? That's 100% right. There's a balloon on the end of these, and it's real dangerous um, to keep that balloon inflated. So once the balloon is in the pulmonary artery, which uh, there is oh, the little, the little uh, syringes on there. There's a little one milliliter syringe on the end of this, uh, this port here. Uh, that syringe is used to inflate and deflate the balloon. We only have a balloon in there because it needs a balloon to float through to get to the right place. But when it gets into the artery, it will wedge in place. That's when we deflate the balloon and we let this catheter flick back and forth into the, um, flicks back and forth 
in the pulmonary artery and we can get a pulmonary artery pressure. We can also get an ejection fraction and a cardiac output by measuring how fast fluid goes through that catheter. So that's a very special thing and I'm not gonna ask you to learn about it, so don't even worry. Um, but if you're in the CVICU, I just wanted to let you know what you might be seeing there. You though are checking pulses, skin warmth, cap refill on all your feet. You will also get an edema assessment and you will have assessed preload and contractility. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on. You gonna let me clear my markings now? That's what I thought. Move on. There we go. Tardiac uh, diags, this is just things to look for in your charts when you do have a patient or expect for them to maybe, if you have a heart patient, they may go to one of these exams. So I would like you to check your charts on your cardiac patients, see if they have continuous EKG monitoring, see if they have any orders for 12 lead EKGs. This is for new rhythms or chest pain. Um, echocardiograms, they can be done, oops, at the bedside or as a transesophageal echo. A transesophageal echo, um, sorry, sir, we're going to use you. Um, that's where they will put a catheter um, orally and into your esophagus because your esophagus is on the backside of your heart and it can take a picture. So that's a transesophageal echo. Um, I didn't mean to give you a transesophageal echo. Um, but otherwise, you can do a bedside ultrasound, which is what this man over here is getting. He's very happy about it. He's getting a bedside ultrasound, just like women get pregnancy ultrasounds, and um, it's getting an ultrasound of his heart can measure the blood flow. Um, both of them are just as good. Transesophageal echoes give them a little more detailed information. It is right behind the heart, a lot less uh, sternum and lungs to get through to see it. <clears throat> they also do exercise treadmill testing. This is to put the heart under stress and see if it produces any arrhythmia, sees what it does to the cardiac output. Um, you can also do electrophysiology where they actually stimulate the heart with medicines or stimulants to try and replicate um, syncope or um, arrhythmias. Chest sand, CT, MRI, these are actually just to look at the structures of the heart. And the cardiac catheterization is where they actually go into the groin. We do have some slides on that and put a catheter up into the heart and um, can actually directly go and do interventions in the heart or the heart vessels. So those are the diagnostic procedures. Let's see, these are the cardiac labs. Um, what I require on my exams is for you to know the troponin, the BNP, a normal ejection fraction. I would like you to do this because I do use CVPs to give you information about your patients. Should be a very easy way to tell if they're overloaded or uh, dehydrated. And I would really love for you to know that diastolic blood pressure because I am a CV ICU nurse and I really want you to know those afterloads. Um, the contractility cardiac output, you do not need to know for the exam, but I will be doing some examples of adequate cardiac output, and I would like you to just recognize that four to eight is normal, but you don't have to memorize it. So there's an asterisk next to that. You can always go back and look at this one if you need it. Um, but you may find these numbers that I want you to know um, in the charts, or if you're in the ICU, maybe on the monitors. Um, the troponin, always look for this in a patient with chest pain. This one is for chest pain because it will measure for heart damage uh, and it is just very few hours. It is only good for 24 hours. So they will do a troponin test and they will look for the rise in troponin in the fall and they know the cardiac event is over. So anything greater than 0.4 is considered um, a problem and that is because this is an enzyme only found in heart muscle. So if it's in the bloodstream, Something leaked it out, and it would be the heart. So that's troponin. BNP is a measure that, cons that measures um, stretch of the heart muscle. It's a enzyme that is um, released when there is, it's in the brain, so it's called B-type. It's a brain natural peptide, but it's also found in the heart, and it is found in great numbers when the heart is exposed to stress, when that muscle is stressed out or stretched, um, the, it, will, it will release BNP. So this is a measure for chronic heart failure. So we're going to call the troponin acute heart damage, and we're going to call the BNP chronic heart failure. Anything over 100 is worrisome, but greater than 500, these are the warning signs. So, hey, guess what? If I'm circling these and saying greater than 0.4 and greater than 500 equals something, 
This might show up on the test. If I have a patient that has a troponin greater than 0.4, they're having acute heart muscle damage. You need to be worried. That's a worrisome cue. Um, uh, BNP greater than 500, that is a chronic heart failure. I will tell you the worse the BNP, the worse the heart failure. I've taken care of patients with BNPs of 10,000. Patients in exacerbations of heart failure can have BNPs of two to three thousands, four thousands, five thousands, when their normal BNP may be around 800. So exacerbations of heart failure, worsening heart failure, have worsening BNPs. Ejection fraction. Um, I'm going to pop out here for a minute for ejection fraction, and we're going to draw our uh, we're going to draw a heart, and I'm going to skip ahead from some slides because when I draw my heart. I want you to understand something. So let's see. This is, um, I'm drawing ejection fraction. I'm going to put this here so I remember what I'm talking about. So what we are talking, we're talking about the left ventricle. We can talk about the right atrium here. Right. Girl, okay. Erase that. That is done. All right. Go back to your pencil. This is the left atrium. And these are the lungs. Two of the lungs, that way. All right, so this is ejection fraction. This is how much, what percentage of the left ventricle gets pumped out during systole. Do you think it's 100%? Can you 100% squeeze out a sponge? Not really. You can wring it, but it's still wet. Kind of the left ventricle, too. That's why our normal EF is 60 to 75%. We really can't get to 100%. It's um, very hard. The heart can't squeeze itself dry. So what we are looking for is if the left ventricle, and I'm just going to say for, for ease's sake, that our ventricle, our left ventricle holds 100 milliliters. Oh, I wrote cc's. I'm old. So let's say our left ventricle holds 100 milliliters of blood. Let's say during systole, a lot of it gets pumped out. How about let's say 70 milliliters gets pumped out. Oh, where'd it go? Go back. <gasps> Did it disappear? Oh, my beautiful art. All right, let's do it again. My C's. Got to draw the load sign to lungs. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. It is full of 100 milliliters of blood. And it needs to pump out into our aorta a certain amount. So we're going to start with 100 milliliters of blood. Okay? Got 100 milliliters of blood, and it gets ejected. This one's closed. You're closed, sir. We'll talk about that. But this is out because this needs to be closed. Your blood's going to go back up there. We don't want blood back up there. It's swirling around in there. But we want it all going out there, and it puts out 70 milliliters. So if it started with 100 and it put out 70, that's 70%. 70 Yay. Let's go back. All right, Mr. Eraser. Yay, it worked. All right. So we still have our 100 milliliters of blood. Thank you, Mr. Eraser. And it is pumping out. Let's say, ah, oh, dude, messed it up again. Keep them. I'm going to go back and see them. All right. You know what? We'll go back to that. We'll go back to that. Let's uh, just remember this cardiac output. Um, don't worry about systemic vascular resistance. Again, this is a big fancy number for what can we get this number from easy. This is resistance. This is afterload. What's the easier way to get this number for afterload? The diastolic blood pressure. I still like that, but this is a big fancy number so that we can protect the heart after cardiac surgery. You have to have that fancy yellow PA catheter to get that number. Don't even worry about it. Get look at your diastolic blood pressure. Um, cardiac output, again, that's just nice to know. You've probably heard about CKMBs, and um, those are kind of older cardiac markers. We use the troponin now. Okay. These are, we were talking about the CVP. Um, oh, and I never mentioned in the afterload section, 
Um, I don't even know why I did SVR here. That's the pulmonary artery catheter. Afterload, you can also read it with an arterial blood pressure, which is this guy, because then you get a continuous monitoring of your afterload. Um, I forgot to mention that there. Because we have things like arterial lines, CVPs, PA lines, and all these things are hooked up to a hemodynamic monitoring device. Okay, this is something where you have a little bag. You have a special, special tubing that is um, pressurized, red hard tubing, I, or clear plastic tubing, but it's hard plastic, not soft, flexible plastic like your regular IV tubing. And it is hooked up to some kind of this engineering magic here. It's called a transducer. Um, it's called a transducer. And um, it creates, what it reads is the pressure in this fluid filled line and it turns it into some kind of magic number on the monitor so all you have to do is have a catheter it doesn't matter where the catheter is you can have a catheter here you can have a catheter in here you can have a pick line in here you could have a catheter in your brain you could have a catheter in your bladder you can hook this hemodynamic monitoring setup to a catheter in the bladder and get a bladder pressure Where's my cat? Where's my PowerPoint going? Um, you can put one in the brain and get an intracranial pressure. It's the same setup system. Um, so you can put this in. This would be a central venous pressure. So anywhere you have an IV catheter, you or a Foley catheter, you can get a pressure. I mean, honestly, we've done abdominal pressures from a bladder because this bladder pressure will tell us if the abdomen's under pressure. So we can measure pressures. All we have to do is get, a, get something that sticks out and hooks onto this catheter. And so every, all these catheters come pre-made with um, transducers on them. We hook them up to fluid-filled bags. I will demonstrate this in class. The setup is not on the exam, but... What you might see if you go into the ER, I am not going to test you on the exam on the um, zeroing of the calibration, how to do it, how to read them. I'm not going to do these things on the exam. But I do think it is important that if you do have a clinical, um, that if you are looking at these arterial lines, the reason we need to do these things is to make sure our numbers are correct. Um, I did a, when I was educator, I had a I was teaching a class, and um, the thing is, is these, okay, I'll go back to this story in a second. The thing is, these catheters, this transducer needs to be at a certain place to read an accurate pressure. It needs to be at a certain place, and it needs to be level with the phlebostatic axis, which is mid-chest and the um, fifth intercostal space. I think it was fifth intercostal space. Um, fourth darn it, fifth or fourth, you know, close. But anyway, mid-chest, fourth intercostal space. So we would just, I aim for the armpit. It's south of the armpit. I mean, honestly. And so um, we will make sure that that transducer is level to that space, to that spot right there at the intersection of the X, the phlebostatic axis. See, just south of the armpit, like I said. Okay, so aim your um, transducer to be at that level. And what we're doing is then we zero it. I could show you the stuff in class. You're not going to get tested on how to zero it or anything. But just know that it does need to be zeroed to calibrate it. And um, we're zeroing Throwing it to atmospheric pressure so it doesn't affect our readings um, because of some engineering magic that happens in the transducer. I don't know. The other thing we need to do is they need to flush it every now and then. I will show you the setup. I will show you how to flush it. You may have seen it in critical care clinical, um, but just need to know that your maintenance of this catheter is going to be involved zeroing it once a shift um, and flushing it every now and then to double check that your catheter is actually reading because if there are air bubbles in the line. Um, remember, this is a fluid-filled line. If there are air bubbles in there, they're going to affect the transmission of um, vibrations through the fluid, and it will cause dampening or low values. And you could have whip, which is where the catheter is just whipping around like a whirlpool in there, and it's um, reading falsely high values. So we are very concerned of looking at this because we don't want to record the patient 
for having falsely high or falsely low values. And there comes my story. We were, I was teaching in the uh, ICU and I was teaching probably just a, the, um, the essentials of cardiac, you know, when people, we bring people into the ICU from the floors and we would just teach them the critical care course. And so we were talking about, um, we were doing a sim, I think, and I took the transducer. And so we were on the setup and instead of having leveled with the phlebostatic access, I dropped the transducer on the floor. So the transducer, it was still hanging on the bag. Everything's fine. Patient wasn't bleeding or anything. But I dropped the transducer onto the floor. And so that it wasn't level with the phlebostatic axis, it was way down on the floor. And what happens when it goes down on the floor is you get a falsely high value. So we were seeing like the, the blood pressure on the monitor was reading like 240 over 100. So they were freaking out, right? So what would you do? If you're in 240 over 100, and again, this was on a arterial line like this. So they were reading it, and it was saying 240 over 100. And I was reading on the monitor. I don't even know what the map would be on that, like 140. I don't know. But um, anyway, 200 over 100 on this thing. So what do you think the nurses are going to do? What would you do? Well, you know what you would do because you saw what I did because I'm kind of tricky. But um, they started getting orders for... Um, vasodilators, because this patient, look at that afflow, that's super constricted. We need to dilate that out. So they're getting orders for blood pressure meds from the doctor. So after they got the blood pressure meds from the doctor, um, I let them give the blood pressure meds to the doctor. I let them give it to him. So they gave 100 milligrams of metoprolol. It was sim. Nobody's going to bad. Let's do this. We're going to flop to something else. So here's the blood pressure. Here's what the monitor's looking like for these nurses, okay? This is exactly what the monitor's looking like. What do you want to do? They call. They get an S-bar for, uh, you know, the 100 milligrams of metoprolol. So we give 100 milligrams of metoprolol. What do you think the blood pressure goes down to? Look at this. We fixed the patients. Everything's amazing. This is amazing. Um, so everything was great, except for the fact that then... I put the monitor, I put the transducer. I'm like, oh, look at your transducer on the ground. Look. This was his real blood pressure once we got him up and transduced. What was the problem was the monitor was falsely high. They treated a falsely high number so that when we put the catheter back into position, the blood pressure would have been fine if they had picked up the transducer and put it back at the phlebostatic access, re-zeroed it. They would have seen that the real blood pressure that said 240 over 100 was really 160 over 80. They gave 100 of metoprolol to 160 over 80. So I killed the patient. Don't do that. Pay attention to your machines, but do not trust your machines. Your machines can fail you. All right, so this is the guide, and this is probably all you need for the test. And we've really talked about all of most of the monitoring keys points now. Um, so for the test, I want you to remember that... Um, we need to zero at the phlebostatic axis. The transducer needs to be in the right part. Make sure the waveforms are delivering accurate data. And you see this. You know what you do? Even if you're not sure about it, start a blood pressure. Start a blood pressure. Because if your blood pressure goes to 119 over 80, and your A blood pressure is reading 79 over 62, which one are you going to trust? You can run another blood pressure if you want. You can run a third blood pressure. You can get a manual blood pressure. But when they don't match, which one's wrong? This, the blood pressure. The automatic machine is wrong. Look at your equipment. Look at your equipment, people. Don't make interventions when your equipment is bad. So that's kind of what we were talking about here. Make sure your waveforms are accurate. Make sure things are zeroed at the axis. Don't, um, arterial lines are monitoring only CVPs, central venous lines. You can infuse things through, but arterial lines and endocranial pressure lines, uh, monitoring only, never give fluids into an artery or a brain. Never give fluids into an artery or a brain. Okay? 
Um, anytime you put a catheter anywhere, you have a risk of bleeding. This is more for um, the CVP side. Uh, bleeding is for everything. Bleeding's for an A line, any line that's in a vessel. That's any line in a vessel. Any line in the brain either. Um, so bleeding is anything. I'm just going to say bleeding is anything. Um, pneumothorax is for CVP only, and air embolism is for CVP only. Um, usually we worry about, and that's when we, you know, when they insert pneumothorax is when they insert and the doctor might accidentally try and get it in the vein, hit a lung, um, you know. Have you ever uh, blown through an IV when you're trying to place an IV? Doctors can blow through a subclavian and into the lung. It happens. Um, air embolism uh, is usually when we pull out a central line, and I put that there. Infection, of course, with any catheter. There's a couple of other things about radial arterial lines. We want to make sure, because we're putting it in a radial artery, that the ulnar artery works, because otherwise you can be cutting off blood flow to the only artery that works. So um, the other thing about IVs in there, hey, how many IVs infiltrate? Well, when an IV infiltrates into an artery, it's considered a dissection. They can also spasm. So there's a lot of complications with having an artery being cannulated. So be very, very careful with those radial arterial lines. Pulmonary artery lines are the big yellow lines that go into the neck and all the way threaded through the heart. So you can imagine a pulmonary infarction because it's sitting in the pulmonary artery. You can have dysrhythmias because it was sitting in the right ventricle. So um, just some things to monitor is definitely the dressing, definitely the catheter site, make sure it's not bleeding, hematomas, um, spasming. The pressure bag is the bag at the top that we is attached to that pressure tube tubing and um, make sure the extremity is perfusing. Always flush the system and assess your waveforms. Um, when we're intervening, we are basically saying, what's our monitoring? We're assessing the system and the catheter every four hours or so. You don't need to um, memorize any of this stuff, but um, this is just a good uh, something that if you're in the ICU, I would probably highlight on uh, these two things that we uh, are looking for the worsening conditions and making sure that our waveforms are okay. In terms of interventions, just remember that you need to assess your system every four hours or more. Um, this is more detail about how to do so. And when you're, uh, you cannot remove a P, you cannot do this as a student, but I need to tell you about, um, you know, for the test. So for the test, you do need to um, know that don't do it while you're a student. <laughs> I put that in there. Good for me. Um, have a patient hold their breath. This avoids the pulmonary um, bubble, the, the bubble that could get in as you pull out the central venous line. Because if you pull out the line and they go, oh, they could pull air into the hole that you just pulled the catheter out of. So um, have their patient hold their breath or tell them to bear down while you're um, removing the catheter. Uh, and hold pressure on the sites. Artery sites need to be held pressure for at least 10 minutes, um, five minutes on venous pressures. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have. I think this is break time because we're gonna go into dysrhythmias. Yes, so take a back. We are into cardiac monitoring and EKGs. Uh, I do not want you to start this section unless you have read the, or gone at least to the drawing section where we did introduce the EKG and why it's doing what it's doing. If you have not done that, please go back and do that now. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. Cardiac monitoring. This is just some information on cardiac monitoring. You should have been shown how to um, read, a, how to put on the cardiac monitor leads at this point in time. This is just a reminder for you on three lead EKG placement and five lead EKG placement where they go. The other thing that I want you to know is that three leads shows you lead one, lead two, lead three. Easy to know. The five lead gives you lead one, lead two, lead three, plus two other leads Where'd my, where did my pen go? Come here, pen. AVL, AVR, AVF. You may go, what the heck are those? What are they reading? Well, I found this when I started teaching in 12 lead EKG class. And I don't really know. I've tried to find this. Um, I can't really read the signature. If you guys can find and get me the email address for this guy, I would like to thank him for how often I have used this um, 
picture. This is actually how the heart sits in the chest, and I just absolutely love this picture because it shows you exactly what we're looking at with the leads. This is how the leads are set up when you put them on the correct way. Lead one is looking from the right. It's looking into the left ventricle. So we are looking at conduction around the left ventricle on the anterior side of the heart. Um, lead two looks up from the underside at the inferior side of the heart. And the way the guy has drawn these pictures, like I need to clear my pen markings because he just did it perfectly. This, um, and the only reason I'm drawing is because I need to highlight what he did here. This side of the the pink color that he did on this side is, um, this is the lateral side of the heart. lateral side of the heart. The lateral meaning the side, right? So all the leads that are in this pink area here is um, looking at that side of the heart. So these leads, when you look at them on the 12 lead EKG, lead AVL, or when you look at them on a on a regular EKG, a five lead EKG, you're looking, if you are seeing something QRSTP. If you're seeing something funny in leads AVL1, V6, V5, you could be having a problem on the lateral side of the heart, or you could be seeing the residual of damage on the lateral side of the heart. So sometimes nurses like to look at V1 because we're concerned about the lateral side of the heart. We can change the leads on many monitors to look at the side of the heart we want to look at. So if your nurse is looking in lead one, AVL, V6, v, well, these are only available on a 12 lead. We can't get the V leads on a monitor, um, at least the unless you get maybe something at Mayo or something where they have a lot of good stuff. Um, I can't get anything, um, or at least I don't think I've used any V leads. Let me just clear this for a minute because it got crazy. So this is the lateral side of the heart. This is the um, lead two, lead three, and AVF are reading the inferior. It's not really inferior side of the heart. And this is the anterior side of the heart. So the stuff in yellow, which are only V leads, is the anterior side of the heart. The lateral side of the heart, we can lead, usually monitor leads one and AVL. The inferior side, or the right ventricle side, is leads three, leads two, and AVF. We can read all of those on the monitor. So when you are looking at lead two and three, we're really looking at the right side of the heart. When we're looking at leads one and AVL, we're looking at the left side of the heart. So, and there's also, um, you know, you got to know what you're looking at. It's a road map. So I love that picture. I think that artist is amazing, and I would really love to get in contact with him and say thank you. So that's what we're looking at. So remember, leads. Um, so if you are worried about something in your heart, I don't know why I keep doing this. If you're worried about something in your heart, and you are worried about the left side of the heart or the lateral side of the heart, I want you to look at leads one or AVL. If you are worried about something on the inferior side or the right ventricle or the right side of your heart, look at leads two, leads three, or AVF. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. And so you can see that we have leads one and three, two and three are looking at the inferior side of the heart, and lead one is looking at the lateral side of the heart. Now, which one do you want to use? Lead two kind of looks at almost everything. It kind of goes in between the right and the left. It's kind of the, the middle ground. So a lot of people like to look at lead two because it does look at the septum and the differentiation between the right and left. So this is why lead two is kind of our favorite. It's just really right there in the middle, and it kind of gets into that anterior side of the heart. Um, so I would say three and AVF or more of the anterior or the under or the inferior sorry or the underside lead two is a nice middle ground that's looking right in between the right and the left ventricle so we can kind of say it's the septal area and so it's kind of just you know 
the average, the medium, which is why most people pick lead two. And then, of course, if we're specific about the left side. So why don't you just kind of take that away from this, that if you want to look at the left side of the heart, look at lead one. If you want to look at kind of the middle of the heart, look at lead two. And if you want to look at the underside of the heart, look at lead three. You're welcome. All right, moving on. EKG paper. Everything I give you on an exam will be a six-second strip, and I will just let you know that know ahead of time. Most, um, if you print out something on a defib monitor or a patient monitor or a central tele monitor, it will print out in a six-second strip. To know that you have a six-second strip, there's usually markers every three seconds in the white part of the paper to let you know that you are on a six-second strip. Um, or to count, if you do have those markers in the top of the paper, pick two sections, and that's a six-second strip. The reason we do that is because you can count really easily. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that is a heart rate of 70 because if it's a six-second strip, there's 10 segments of um, 10. Oh, they're six. 10 six-second segments in a minute. So if you measure your heart rate times 10, you get your rate. All right, or you get the number of QRSs times 10, you get your rate. All right, EKG paper. I think that's the six-second strip. We've covered that. When I am giving you numbers, I'm talking about large boxes and small boxes. Um, this is a large box between the heavy pink lines. So these would be large boxes. This is gonna be important because I give you your time in boxes. Large boxes are 0 0.2 seconds. That's wrong. No, that's right. 0 0.2 seconds. I, I just did that on instinct, and then my brain started telling me I was wrong. I wasn't wrong. Large boxes are 0 0.2 seconds. I'll tell you why in a second. A small box, I can't even draw a small box. Oh, I did it. A small box is this guy up here. That small box, these are these small guys, these itty-bitty little boxes. These are small boxes. Large boxes are 0.2 seconds. Small boxes are 0 0.04 seconds. Now, do you need to memorize that? No. I count number of small boxes and number of large boxes. But if you get calipers and you measure or you're really nerdy, you can count the number of small boxes and multiply times the number of boxes, and you get how many seconds. But there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 small boxes in one large box, right? There's five of them. One, two, three, four, five. Five times 0 0.04 seconds is 0 0.2 seconds. So we just kind of know that a large box is 0.2, a small box is 0.04. And so if you're measuring a PQRS, which we will do on the final slides. We will be measuring boxes or you can measure seconds. Um, all right, let's keep going. This is just review. I already did this. Uh, this is just another schematic of watching um, atrial conduction and contraction, which is the P wave. Oh, it's called the isoelectric pause, not the SQ. See, I think SQ would have been not PQ. Should have been called a PQ segment. It's called an isoelectric pause. I guess, you know, everybody's got to be fancy. So anyway, um, P wave, isoelectric pause, or as I call it, the PQ segment. Um, that's when the atrium contracts. All right, ventricle conduction, we said, was the QRS wave. And then the isoelectrical pause, I call it the ST segment because it's where we notice the ST, but that's because when the ventricle is having trouble contracting, what do we see? Ooh, 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 the ventricle can't contract, so it never goes back to its baseline. We get an ST elevation. So that's because there's a problem with contraction. Oh, no. So that's where the contraction happens is in this pause and the ST elevation. You're welcome.
All right, so I'm going to teach you to do a little bit differently than most people teach to read the EKG. The first thing I want to know is the rate. I'm going to tell you, oh, they have this marked in seconds. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. This is a six-second strip. So we're going to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Aw, oh, eight times ten is eighty. We like that. All right, the QRS interval. This is the important part. This is going to dump you into a category. We look for one to three small boxes. The QRS should be one to three small boxes. That's a whole lot easier than memorizing a number of seconds. So one to three small boxes is normal for a QRS. It means it's narrow. It's normal to be narrow if you're a QRS. If it's longer than three, three to small boxes, it is a wide QRS. I will tell you right now, I'll give you a hint. The narrow QRS means the problem with conduction is in the atrium because conduction's getting around the ventricle just fine because the QRS is normal and narrow. And so that means that the problem is atrial because the ventricle is okay. So if it's normal and narrow, we have an atrial problem because the ventricle is okay, because if it wasn't okay, it wouldn't conduct well. So a normal narrow QRS, the ventricle is okay, the atrium is a problem. If the QRS is wide, this means the ventricle conduction is the problem. And then we'd have to look at the atria the P wave to see if the atrium's okay. But first of all, I want you to look at the QRS interval right after the rate, rate and QRS. Look to see if it's normal and narrow or wide because if it's normal and narrow and you're having weird beats, they're atrial problems. If it's wide and weird, then your problem is a ventricle problem. So we're gonna go through this and I will tell you that just being able to dump it into a category with the QRS intervals will get you right to your interventions. You don't even have to name it. The next thing is we can look at the PR, and that will give us information about what? Atrial conduction, right? Because the P wave is atrial conduction, and the weight of the Q, the PEQ, that S isoelectric pause, is atrial contraction. So really, this PR width is looking at the atrium atrial conduction and contraction. The QRS and the ST segment are looking at ventricle conduction and contraction. The PR width is our atrial thing. So we once we decide whether it's an atrial problem, ventricular problem, we go over and we look at the PR, which is the space from the P wave to the R wave. Um, this PR width is three to five small boxes. And that is something like if that's what we're looking for. If it's longer than five small boxes, we have a heart block. If the PR width varies from beat to beat, you have a heart block. And if you have no regular P waves to measure with, you got to take a look and see what the, what's the problem in the artery, in the atrial area. Um, we also look at whether it's regular or irregular, but it really doesn't help you decide the rhythm at all. So I'm going to leave it alone. The QT width is something that we use for, this is for the reset time. QT is for reset, and the reason we do this is a lot of cardiac drugs prolong the reset time. So if the reset time is prolonged, prolonged, dear Lord, if the reset time is prolonged, we are going to have trouble um, with the chance of a arrhythmia. Okay, so we're going to head into these cardiac disorders. The reason I put arrhythmias or dysrhythmias in the myocardium is this is the heart muscle, heart muscle myocardium. And these are the problems with our heart muscle. The reason I get dysrhythmias in there is because we conduct through the heart muscle. So if we, the heart muscle is something wrong, we conduct through that muscle, we will see dysrhythmias. Um, and we will also say damage to the muscle. So we are going to spend a minute in myocardium. Uh, we will spend a shorter minute in endocardium and pericardium, and then we will go through the cardiac um, procedures.
into the myocardium disorder, which is disorders of the actual heart muscle. Myocardium is heart muscle. So this will include heart failure because that's when the heart muscle either um, gets too weak or too bulky to able to eject properly. Myocarditis is infections, dysrhythmias I put in here because we conduct through the heart muscle and usually when conduction is a problem, then the heart muscle follows. So we put dysrhythmias in here well and I will also review uh, a little bit about MI. The next three slides, one, two, three, these are not things that will be questioned per se on the test, but are vocabulary for your patients' histories and physicals, um, vocabulary for patients and heart failure. Uh, just recognize what these things mean and maybe recognize some of the definitions here. So chronic heart failure takes years to decades to create. So the causes are going to be things that take years or decades to destroy the heart hypertension, atherosclerosis, valve disorders usually do last for a while uh, before they start having symptoms. COPD takes a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to twist that. COPD takes a while to affect the heart. You can also have chronic heart failure after an acute heart failure episode, after an MI or scarring from cardiac infections, because you take about a year to heal. And if your heart does not heal from the myocardial infarction or the cardiac infections, they may be then relegated to chronic heart failure if their acute heart failure has not healed. Uh, but chronic heart failure is from causes that take years to decades. Acute heart failure is causes that are abrupt. So things like an acute MI, pulmonary embolus, infections, anaphylaxis, malignant hypertension, all these things uh, cause problems to the heart. All these three here cause um, actual heart muscle damage. And anaphylaxis is a problem of afterload. This is basically afterload vasodilation. This is massive vasodilation causing heart failure because the massive vasodilation causes too much um, not enough resistance. The heart has to pump real hard to fill it. And malignant hypertension is a problem of afterload. But this is vasoconstriction. So you can see that and sorry for my bad typewriting, this is vasoconstriction. But anaphylaxis and malignant hypertension are acute causes of acute heart failure, but they don't damage the heart muscle themselves. Anaphylaxis causes massive vasodilation and malignant hypertension causes massive vasoconstriction. Both of those put such a change to the heart that it makes the heart work too hard and fail uh, abruptly. Anyway, again, not a test question. Um, I do want to point out the difference between systolic failure and diastolic failure, but notice how I'm not putting any cues on here because heart failure cues do not depend on the type of heart failure. Heart failure is heart failure is heart failure in terms of cues. These are just things that you will be finding in your chart. Um, systolic failure is a failure to, what do we do during systole? Failure to eject all the ventricle. So systolic failure is going to be when our ejection fraction is less than 40. Anytime our ejection fraction gets low, it is because the muscle is too weak to eject everything in the ventricle. Ventricles can also dilate out because you can see the difference in the size of the heart walls here. The dilated ventricle has thin, weak walls. And this is usually caused by stretching or damage to the tissue. So when this tissue is damaged, it just isn't as strong anymore. It is weak. It's just like if you stay in bed for a week, when you get out of bed, you're going to be a little wobbly and you need some rehabilitation to get that muscle stronger. This will happen in dilated cardiomyopathy as well. Because of some damage to the heart muscle, the, ves the muscle has thinned, causing it to bulge out a little bit and it um, does not compress well. So it's thin, weak walls. The heart doesn't pump well. You get an ejection fraction less than 40%. This is our most common form of heart failure. Um, so that is systolic failure. There is also a diastolic failure, which is 
there is a common cause. But what do we do? This is a failure to, what do we do during diastole? Failure to fill ventricle sufficiently. So why are we failing to sufficiently to fill the ventricle? It's a failure to fill the ventricle. It's because the ventricle has become too large or thick or does not. And I'm going to just point out before I go into these descriptions, you don't need to know how to read S3s and S4s. But I just want to make sure that in case you are interested, um, you could hear the difference. We will talk about heart sounds when we talk about valves. And I will come back to these heart sounds, but you do not need to memorize those for the test, which ones go with which. Um, S3, S4 are sounds of heart failure. You do not know, need to know which one is which. Um, but let's take a look at this hypertrophic muscle. Where the dilated muscle was very thin and weak, this muscle is super strong compared to a normal heart muscle. It is bulky and it is strong. So why is that a problem? We love strong muscles, right? Well, in the case of a bodybuilder, sometimes your muscles just get so big you can't put your arms down. Well, in this heart, this muscle gets so, so big that look what happens to the ventricle filling space. If this one can hold this much fluid, this one can only hold this much fluid. So if this one can hold 100 milliliters, this one can only hold 50 milliliters. So we have a problem in that we cannot eject uh, we can eject all of most of our amounts of fluid that are in the ventricle, but it's just not enough fluid in the ventricle. So let me, you don't need to know the causes of this either. Um, restrictive heart failure is very real, uh, very rare. Um, and this is usually caused by autoimmune disorders or inflammatory complexes, things like sarcoidosis and things like that. So um, pretty rare. But what I want to show you is the difference between this one, where in systolic heart failure, our EF is less than 40. In diastolic heart failure, the EF can be normal. Oh, wait. You're like, well, wait a minute. You just told me that the definition of heart failure is an EF less than 40. Well, that is true but this EF can be normal. You could say that the more common heart failure is systolic failure, and that's the one that most people have, and so that's the definition we use. Why does this one have a normal ejection fraction? We're gonna have to do a little bit of math. Let's go back to this one. Let's say that this one, our normal, holds 100. I don't even, it's not really 100, but it's easy math. This one holds 100, this one holds, let's say, 150 milliliters. The restricted one, so this is the dilated one, the restricted one, or the diastolic failure one, the one where it's hypertrophic and large and restricting the size of the ventricle, we have our ventricle holding 100, and then the restricted ventricle holds 50. So we have a little bit of a difference here, that this one's holding 150, this one's holding 50. So let's take a look at this one. We gotta do a little bit of math here that might explain this. If we have a normal heart, let's go where we have a little bit more room. Our normal ventricle holds 100 milliliters. We're gonna have your other one have a ventricle of 150 milliliters. We are going to say that this ejection fraction for the normal heart we're going to write this as a normal heart, and this is a dilated heart. Dilated slash systolic failure. Sorry, my handwriting gets really bad when I do this. So we have the dilated systolic failure and the normal heart. This ventricle is holding 100, and we have an EF, let's just say, of 70% because our normal was 60 to per 70. So what are we ejecting with each beat, which is also known as the stroke volume? We are ejecting about 70 milliliters with each beat. Does everybody see how we do that? 70% of 100 is 70 milliliters. So we are ejecting about 70 milliliters with each beat, and let's just say our heart rate is 70. 
beats per minute. So that means we are putting out 49,000 milliliters a minute, which is 4.9 liters per minute. Remember back where we were talking about normal cardiac output? This is a normal cardiac output. Four to eight is our normal cardiac output. So this is normal. Now we have our ventricle of 150 milliliters, and let's say our ejection fraction is 30% because we said dilated failures are kind of weak, so it's not ejecting all of this. So what is 10% of 150 is 15. So we are putting out with each beat, oh, I'm doing math in my head, 45 milliliters a beat. Somebody check me with a calculator. If our stroke volume is 45 milliliters a beat, we're not putting out very much with each beat. So the brain's gonna ask our heart rate to go up a little bit. So let's give us a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. And that will give us 4.5 liters per minute. So you see how the heart rate has to go up to get us a normal cardiac output. Let's say that for some reason, this failing heart drops its heart rate to 80, which we think is normal. Well, eight times, oh, I did hard math. Eight times 45. If our heart rate was 80, we would have eight times four. Somebody do that with the math, but I think it's around 3.8 liters per minute, which is below normal. So this is why heart failure patients always have increased heart rates because they're trying to get a normal cardiac output. And they're only putting out 45 milliliters with each beat, so they need more beats to get a normal output. But let's take a look at our, and so really the moral of this story is that a dilated failure needs to beat faster in order to get out enough cardiac output. Let's talk about this one where you said the EF could be normal. Well, we're gonna do the same math calculations over here as soon as I can find a space big enough for my math calculations. Let's put them over here. Let's say our normal heart holds 100 milliliters and the EF we said was 70%. And so our stroke volume is 70 milliliters per beat. And the heart rate is usually, well, let's give this person 80 beats per minute. They're putting out 5.6 liters per minute. Yes, you can be in awe of my math skills if I'm doing math right in my head. You'll have to double check me on the calculator. Let's look at our hypertrophic heart. Their, oops, it's not normal. Their ventricle. Remember, we're going to go over here to see how much their ventricle holds. The normal holds 100. The hypertrophic one only holds 50. So the ventricle holds 50 milliliters. We're going to say the EF, because we said the EF can be normal. Let's give them an EF of 70. Their stroke volume, if they're doing 70%, 10 is 5, so it's 300 or 35 milliliters per beat. You're like, but wait a minute. At 70%, they were putting out 70 milliliters a beat because the ventricle held more. They can even have an EF of 100%, which no one can get. Even if their EF was 100%, they would still only be putting out 50 milliliters per beat. So that's still less than the normal heart because even though this heart is strong, sorry, let me see if I can figure out how to use the eraser here. Even though this heart is strong, it cannot, well, where's my eraser? I don't know why the eraser works sometimes on here and not other times on here. I think what I'm trying to show you is that because the ventricle can't hold as much, then it doesn't matter what the ejection fraction is. The ejection fraction will be as strong as you want. It's still not putting out enough. Let's go back to the EF of 70. On 5%, they're putting out 35 milliliters per beat because they can never get 100 milliliters out. And if they're putting out 35 milliliters per beat, do you think the heart rate's going to go up? You know it is. The heart rate's going to go up to 100. 
and beats per minute. And at 35 beats per minute, even at 100, it's still putting out 30.5 milliliters per minute, which is too low. So this hypertrophic heart, even though the ejection fraction is 70, it's not enough. We could even give this thing the ventricle 50 milliliters if we gave it an EF of 80%. 80% of 50 the only way I could do this in my head is take 10%, 10% is 5, and then multiply it times 8. The EF of 80% will give you 40 milliliters per beat. Not enough. Not enough. 40 milliliters per beat times 100 beats, that's right at the 4 liters. So even though the EF looks like this heart is strong, it is not perfusing enough to the body. So this is still called failure because the cardiac output is too low. What do you think you will see if the output or the contractility is low? Well, the contractility is actually normal on here, but the output is low. Um, you'll see tachycardia and failure, symptoms of failure. So what are those symptoms of failure? Oh my God, we already talked about them back in the drawing section of this portion. But if your heart failure is right-sided, which is what I tried to draw up here, because this is the right heart and this is the left heart. So we cut out, that's what this drawing means, the right heart broke. Something in there, one of the valves on the right side, maybe the muscles on the right side, something in the right side of the heart is not pumping appropriately. It will back up to the venous circulation and the liver and the GI system. So the right heart failure is going to give you venous back up in the body, which is going to look like edema, hepatomegaly, spinomegaly. We expect this because your heart's not working. We expect some backup. We expect a decrease in oxygenated blood. Why? Because whatever's getting through here is just a trickle. Not a whole bunch, just a trickle. And that trickle is getting oxygenated fully, but there's just not enough of it to supply to the body. So a decrease in oxygenated blood, because where's all the blood? Back here. That's not oxygenated blood, that's venous blood. So the venous blood is not oxygenated, it's all backed up. And what is getting oxygenated is a thin trickle, which will go and join the backup later on. So we do expect shortness of breath with exertion because this means that, you know, whenever you try to up your heart rate or try to up your oxygen amount, the heart's failing at providing that. So you do get shortness of breath with exertion expected. And dry lung sounds, meaning there's no pulmonary edema. There's nothing to back up into the lungs, so we're not going to get any wet lungs with right-sided heart failure. Um, you will have, the heart has to work harder because it's only putting out this trickle out here. The brain is going to say, hey, we're not getting enough. Keep hard, working harder, which means they'll get tachycardic and you'll see tachycardia. Tachycardia is a sign that the body's not getting enough perfusion. And so if we are seeing that tachycardia in a heart failure patient, especially if the heart rate is going up and up and up in a heart failure patient, they are not perfusing appropriately and we probably need to intervene. So that looks like worsening cues where we need to intervene. If we are worsening the venous backup, we get JVD. We talked about that. Increase in pitting edema because everything getting around is just going back to the backup and our pitting edema starts to get more. If they are not um, measuring their pitting edema, they may be measuring themselves every day and we can't measure edema. There's no measurement for it. So edema is just fluid in the tissues. There's no way we can measure it. So weight is the only way to measure fluid in the body. If you're gaining weight, you are probably holding on to fluid in your tissues um, if you're gaining it quickly, like within a few days to a week. Worsening decrease in oxygenated blood, most importantly, shortness of breath at rest. This means you don't get enough oxygen when you're just doing nothing. That's a pretty bad sign. If you're just sitting there short of breath, you can't do anything. That is a worsening condition. Um, hypoxia, meaning that you are actually low on oxygen. Renal failure, because you're not getting blood flow to your kidneys. Um, confusion would be if you're not getting enough blood flow to your head. 
And then worsening cardiac workload, we still get tachycardia, but worsening, so that's greater than 120. Remember, expected is 100 to 120. This means over 120. So if our heart rate is climbing and climbing and climbing, and we're getting into the 130s, 140s, that could be a sign that the brain is telling the heart to work harder. Also chest pain, because do you remember when we talked about the aorta? If we look at that aorta, the first thing the heart feeds is itself, which were the, the coronary arteries. So if you're having chest pain, your coronary arteries are not getting perfused. That means you're not putting out very much at all. And that is a worsening cue um, if you have a decreased blood pressure. So really, these we already talked about, and you can kind of imagine themselves for yourself um, if you're doing a test question. Left side, we're talking about, again, the, something happened on the left side. Where is the backup going to go? Oh, right to our lovely little lungs and cause fluid in the lungs. So we do expect some lung fluid backup, meaning we get crackles in our bases. We want crackles in our bases because that means, well, we don't want them at all, but that would be what we expect because there's a lot of fluid backup and it's going to push out and hopefully just getting a little bit of fluid out into the bases of those alveoli where we have more will relieve the pressure in the heart. So just a few crackles in the bases, maybe a wet cough, Orthopnea, did we talk about orthopnea? Orthopnea means using pillows to sit upright. This is kind of like um, upright and breathe. Because, you know, if you're in a hospital bed, you can just raise the head of the bed. People at home will use pillows to raise themselves up in bed. And so if they have orthopnea, that means they are using pillows to um, breathe well. They're basically raising their own head of the bed. So that's something that we expect because they've got crackles in their bases when they're getting fluid back up. We still get decrease in oxygenated blood this time because the fluid is backing up. We still have a trickle getting out to the body. And so we have the same symptoms as right-sided heart failure with the decrease in oxygenated blood and the increased workload. But the difference is wet versus dry lung sounds. Um, worsening for left heart failure would be worsening lung backup, which would be pink frothy sputum, meaning you are actually getting so much fluid pushed out of your capillaries that you are getting some red blood cells into your alveoli. Normally red blood cells are too big to cross the capillary, but that means the pressures in the capillaries are so high, it's pushing red blood cells out. That's a pretty bad backup. Pink frothy sputum, wet lung sounds, meaning now they're not just in the bases. You might have crackles and rails, which are very coarse crackles all the way up into your upper lobes. Um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is, um, is basically dry drowning. This is where we have so much fluid in the lungs that the lungs have filled with fluid and they are literally drowning in their own, uh, lung fluid backup. So that is something where the person is, um, laying down or orthopnic and they still feel like they can't breathe and they are coughing up a ton of pink frothy sputum. It is a pretty late sign and it is actually a drowning without ever having been in water. Um, and then we have the same signs as right heart failure in the decrease in oxygenated blood and the worsening cardiac workload. But we went over all these signs and symptoms back in the drawing. Uh, for heart failure, because of what's happening, we're always going to be looking at lung sounds and looking at oxygenation. We are going to be looking at perfusion to check contractility, heart rates, pulses, skin color, urine output. We're going to be watching preload, which means we're looking for edema or JVD. You may be able to see maybe a swollen area under the right rib cage, which is um, hepatosplenomegaly. You may, we're going to be watching the afterload. So we're gonna be watching the three pieces of heart things to make sure that we know how to assess them. After load, we said was the diastolic blood pressure. So you will be watching your blood pressure, edema, and heart rate pulses, skin color, cap refill on all your heart patients, always, all the time. Check your charts for a BNP to see if we can stage, if their heart failure is getting worse. 
um, the ejection fraction, the last done ejection fraction, any heart failure patient will probably have an echo at some point during their hospital stay where you can get that ejection fraction. You can also get it from a cardiac cath lab report. Um, and then also, hey, if the liver's backed up, you might have increased liver function tests. You might have increased clotting times. And if your kidney is not being uh, perfused, you might have increased BUN and creatinine. So here are the three things. This is, doesn't matter if you have systolic, diastolic, acute, chronic heart failure. Any, chron any heart failure is going to get, we've got to fix the three things. We have contractility, preload, and afterload. So to fix contractility, if that's the issue, we only have to do this if the EF is less than 40. If the EF is less than 40, we might need something to help a thin, weak muscle uh, squeeze better. Uh, if we have the EF less than 40 or decreased perfusion, you may get a patient that uh, needs help with improving contractility. For these patients, those weak muscles, if you got out of bed after laying in a week and your muscles were wobbly and weak, you wouldn't just say, well, that's the way your legs are now. No, you would say, all right, let's go to rehab. Let's walk your legs. Let's strengthen them up a little bit. We'll do the same thing with the heart. If your heart has a weak muscle, we're going to try to rehab it. That doesn't mean you're going to run a marathon. It means you're going to just do some light walking or low impact activity. That's the exercise for improving cardiac contractility. So never let your patients just do nothing. If they're getting short of breath with exertion, then they need to slow their activity down, but they need to stay active. So no bed rest for our heart failure patients. Um, control risk factors, avoid alcohol. And the only oral med we have for staying at home to increase contractility is digoxin at this point. So we're going to talk about digoxin, but remember, our patients are going to get that only if your EF is less than 40 and you have decreased perfusion. They have found that calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors are actually very good as well. So we could put um, ARBs and ACE um, because those are actually... Um, prescribed more commonly than digoxin, less side effects, and in uh, decreasing the side effects in the preload, ARBs and ACE inhibitors also decrease um, uh, preload reduction. But they actually actually help the cart contract as well. So you may see uh, some of our afterload reducers are also used to improve contractility. Um, so PO digoxin, though, is the only med that officially actually helps the heart pump harder. If we are having maybe worsening heart failure or decompensated a chronic heart failure, they can come into the hospital. We do have IV inotropes which you will go into your pharmacology part at the end and recognize them, but they are uh, milrinone, dopamine, and dibutamine. So if your patient is having um, decreased perfusion, maybe decreased blood pressure, too high of blood heart rate, um, we need to give them something to increase contractility, and that would be inotropes. Uh, if the inotropes are not working and the heart is still not contracting well, we may have to go in and do some help with mechanical support. You will not be tested on mechanical support, but just in case you need to know what comes after if the IV inotropes don't work, we do move to mechanical support. And then um, really transplant is our only option. We will talk about a myectomy, but transplant is the best option for people who are so badly in failure that nothing else is helping, then they will need a new heart. So contractility, oral is digoxin. In decompensated, we can go to IV forms of inotropes. Preload reduction means reducing the amount of fluid returning to the heart, which is exactly what you would think would get rid of fluid, diuretics. Um, oral doses of diuretics are used with existing cues. They can also have a low sodium avoid excess fluid diet um, along with their diuretics. And they can also take vasodilators. At this point, we're using topical or sublingual nitroglycerin that helps dilate the coronary arteries as well as nitroglycerin's a venous uh, dilator. Um, it dilates the coronary arteries 
and the veins in our bloodstream. So we do like nitroglycerin in that it can dilate the veins a little more and help reduce the preload to the heart. Um, the worsening cues, we basically, we're still going to use diuretics, just increased or high doses, and then we can turn to IV vasodilators to get rid of or hide some of that extra fluid in the body until the diuretics can work. After load reduction, so I'm just going to go back before we go to after load. You can imagine our trouble managing preload along with acute renal failure or chronic renal failure. If your heart failure patients have renal failure as well, this is a big challenge because sometimes in renal failure, your diuretics don't work. Um, sometimes these patients might need dialysis to do preload reduction. Um, so that is an extra challenge with patients with heart failure and renal failure because the diuretics are the key way to reduce preload and diuretics don't work in renal failure. Um, so just so you know, it does get complicated. But these are the simple tenets to how to take care of heart failure. Contractility, preload reduction, and afterload reduction, which are blood pressure medicines. Afterload reduction is getting the blood vessels to go from vasoconstricted back to normal. Because if our blood vessels are vasoconstricted, that means you have an increased blood pressure. We don't want hypertension. We want a normal blood pressure. So afterload reducers are just antihypertensives. We can do, if worsening cues, we could do IV doses of antihypertensives or IV infusions of vasodilators. So all of that, everyone was freaking out about heart failure when there's only three things to do. It's the best we can do for these hearts. We need to reduce the fluid they have to deal with, reduce the resistance they have to pump against, and then try to help their muscles squeeze a little better. You thought it would be a lot harder, right? It's three things. Um, ditch toxicity, we do have to throw ditch toxicity in here because it is, have, it is used um, for cardiac contractility in patients, outpatient. Patients need to know, and you need to know as well, the signs of ditch toxicity, definitely. Um, you need to know to tell your patients that they need to report to the doctor nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps. It's the first sign of ditch toxicity. Some patients may say, oh, I just had the flu. No, you were ditch toxic. Don't guess. Go talk to your doctor. Go to the urgent care. See your primary care. If you have nausea, vomiting, even if you think it's the flu, go get your ditch level checked because you don't want to think, you don't want to treat it like the flu when you're actually ditch toxic. Um, and the first sign just looks like the flu, your nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps. Um, you could also have vision changes. You could have yellow green kind of tint to your eyes, could have halos, could have blurred or double vision. So along with that nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, you'll have vision changes. Um, bradycardias, digoxin slows conduction through the heart, allowing the heart to have time to fill and then gather energy to squeeze better. So we like the heart to beat slower rather than faster, but it also, but we don't want getting too slow. So DIG is held if the heart rate is less than 60 because digoxin causes bradycardias. And if, the, if it's causing a bradycardia, you could be DIG toxic. So one of the signs of DIG toxicity is bradycardias. Hold your DIG, get a DIG level. I am just going to put potassium imbalance on your list of four things. Don't make a list of more than four things. Nausea, vomiting, flu-like symptoms, vision changes, bradycardias, and potassium imbalance. When you get a DIG level, always check a potassium level. This is because hypokalemia causes DIG toxicity, and DIG toxicity causes hyperkalemia. So rather than remember all that, when you get a DIG level, get a potassium level with it. When your patient's on DIG, always watch the potassium level, moral of the story. There will probably be a question about DIG and potassium on the NCLEX, it always is. Um, any DIG toxic patient needs their DIG discontinued immediately and they need to um, watch the potassium level. Uh, this is just an if and a nice thing for clinical. Um, because in high potassium, uh, we don't give calcium gluconate. That is because that will that could possibly mess up the sodium potassium pumps so badly that um, 
the heart may stop. So just don't give calcium in the presence of high potassium. Uh, that is something where sometimes they'll push calcium to stimulate the heart to contract better. Um, it's don't even worry about. It. You know what? That's a that's a neat, that's an ICU nurse thing. Just skip that. Um, you should have a code nurse dealing with that if you're dealing with that. Um, so just skip that. You don't need to memorize that for the test. But that is the reason if you have a high potassium or sodium potassium channel pumps are so messed up. Remember with high potassiums, you get that widened QRS. It's because it's taking a long time for conduction to get around the ventricle. And we don't want to excite the heart in the middle of that by giving calcium. It could cause VFib, VTAC. So it's, it's bad, you know. So with, if you have high potassium, you're not supposed to give calcium with it because it'll mess up your heart big time. Um, these are just informational slides. I'm not going to give you test questions. Um, if you want to know more about the balloon pump or the ventricular sport, ventricular assist device, you can come and chat with me. I can tell you all about it, but I am not going to test you on it. These are the mechanical support for when IV inotropes do not help the heart contract or the heart has been so damn badly damaged that we just need to let it rest. Uh, these are two ways we can do that. Um, the two procedures would be a heart transplant, which we do. We will talk about a heart transplant when we're talking about our post-operative care. Myectomy is um, basically where they lop out in a hypertrophic heart where they have that huge vessel and you can only hold 50 milliliters here. They can lop out a piece of it to make the ventricle normal sized again. Uh, they could do this in the cath lab or open heart. So it would depend on uh, what kind of procedure they had, what kind of care they would need afterwards. And then teaching for heart failure, guys. Teaching for heart failure is really teaching your patients how not to get into decompensated heart failure. They still need to manage their symptoms. They need to manage their causative factors. They need to eat a heart healthy diet. Why? Low sodium to decrease preload. If they have high sodium, their fluid's going to be retained and they're going to have an increased preload. We don't want increased preload in hearts. We want decreased preload. Low cholesterol will be Decrease the atherosclerosis. I'm not even going to try to spell that. Decrease plaque. Avoid excess fluids. We want to keep our preload down. And alcohol actually, it depresses things. It makes your heart kind of weak and lazy, just like it kind of makes us weak and lazy. Um, so we don't want that. And this, you could explain to your patients why. You're not just telling them it because you're a nurse and you have to tell them stuff. If you tell them why, they're more likely to do it. Um, you want them doing low impact exercise. Again, we don't just say, well, that's how your legs are now. Sorry you spent a month in bed, but yeah, you're never going to walk again. No, you're going to go to rehab. Hearts need to go to rehab too. Um, have them track their symptoms and make sure they talk to the doctor when their symptoms are worsening. You can watch for worsening symptoms in the hospital, but patients need to know when their symptoms are worsening so they can get to the doctor rather than wait for it to be too late and they have to be transported to the ER in heart failure. Um, take a little break, take a pause. When you're back, myocarditis is um, inflammation and it's usually post-viral. It's usually seven to 10 days after a viral infection. In fact, we saw a lot of it with COVID. After COVID, we had a lot of myocarditis. COVID liked to um, bind to the heart tissue and cause myocarditis. Um, some patients heal from it. Some people develop heart failure. Depends on how damaged your tissue are. But basically, when this muscle is inflamed, you don't conduct well, you don't squeeze well, and it hurts. It hurts. Um, because it's viral, it has a low-grade fever. Um, there will be ST segment changes. Why are there ST segment changes? Because in the QRS, it takes a little bit longer to get back around. This is normal. See how it comes back to this isoelectric line here? These kind of come back to the same baseline. ST elevation is where it goes up and down and around, but never quite goes back to baseline. What do you need? I'm just going to plant monitors. The cats have eaten, so you're free. 
Thank you. All right. When this returns, it just kind of comes back to the next QRS. And so you see these ST elevations because this is the baseline here, and it never really returns to that baseline or it returns very slowly. And that is because it's having a hard time getting around the ventricular muscle. It's going from, if I make this, let me change this color here to something that we can see. Remember, this was the SA node up here, and then we had the AV node here. Remember, it has to go all the way around here. If it takes a while, it's going to show up on the EKG as taking a while. It's like, oh, it took me a lot longer. Whereas if it's here, it's done. Here, remember, we read those EKGs in seconds. This took a long time to get around this muscle because it's damaged and inflamed and swollen and things are blocked and it just takes a little while longer. So they will have ST segment changes. Oh, I kind of like the highlighter. Maybe I'll leave the highlighter. We'll leave this for a while. Pleuritic chest pain. Why pleuritic chest pain? Anybody have any ideas? It's pleuritic because the heart hurts. It hurts and it's swollen and it's inflamed. So if it is swollen and inflamed and every time it beats, it's irritated, well, you're going to have pain every time it beats. And it's going to be worse when the lungs are big and swollen with air. It's going to rub on that poor inflamed heart. You're also going to hear a friction rub, which is when you're trying to hear heart sounds, you're just going to hear because this is all inflamed and swollen. They may also have shortness of breath with exertion because they are not beating as well when the heart muscle is swollen. They're going to have a few um, heart failure cues, but we want, if they're going to have multiple signs and symptoms of right or left heart failure, that would be unexpected with myocarditis. Most myocarditis does not swell to the point of affecting perfusion. Um, they could also have dysrhythmias because for the same thing we talked about, it's going to take longer for... Uh, conduction to get around swollen muscles. So those are your cues. We are going to monitor all the same things that we would for heart failure because our worsening cue is heart failure. Um, we're also going to monitor the infection that they have, uh, temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, white blood cell count, blood cultures are great. Any infection in the heart muscle, that infection could travel into the bloodstream very easily and cause a bloodstream infection. So we would want to do blood cultures with myocarditis. Um, and definitely monitor their pain level. That's probably going to be at the top for patients. But for you, you are monitoring for dysrhythmias and heart failure and that the infection is improving, not worsening. So the patient wants pain. They always want their pain controlled. Um, don't forget about the patient. And so that just leads us to exactly what we're going to do. I just told you what we were going to do. Um, cardiac rest means restricted activity or bed rest, but not no activity. Restricted meaning they're going to get short of breath easily. Take it easy. Take it slow. Um, bed rest, but not strict bed rest. We do want our patients moving around, even though the heart is swollen, it is a muscle, it still needs to move around. So don't ever answer uh, with strict bed rest. Most patients do not get strict bed rest this, these days. Um, restricted activity, they might need supplemental oxygen. That's not a given. You have to have a low O2 sat to get oxygen. Blood cultures, for the reasons I told you before, because we want to make sure uh, what that is that's affecting the heart and whether it's in the bloodstream, they will get antibiotics or antivirals depending on the culture and what is in the heart. For the patient, they want their inflammation and pain gone. So what do we give for inflammation? Anti-inflammatories. They love non-steroidal ones, which are NSAIDs. What are our NSAIDs real quick? Aspirin. Oh, I could never spell aspirin. Um, uh, uh, ibuprofen. Profen, which is also a Motrin. And then the IV version is Toradol. Oh, I should tell you it's Ketorolac. Ketorolac. 
So Ketorolac will be in your books as pain control, but um, it is actually a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So it's IV Motrin and it's amazing. IV Ketorolac. So NSAIDs would be the best and then steroids if they need them, but um, the pain control will be non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Those are the best thing for them. So when the patient asks for morphine, you can explain to them why non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are actually better for the inflammation of their heart muscle than a narcotic. Um, and if they have any symptoms of heart failure, how would you manage symptoms of heart failure with preload reduction, afterload reduction, and increased contractility? This one I put third for these patients because they're already having pain with contraction, so we might not want to do that one because it will increase their pain. But we could certainly take care of preload and afterload. Um, for the patient, because it's usually um, viral, uh, they might be on antibiotics and antivirals for a while. Um, and just to ease up on any strenuous activity for up to three months, allowing those tissues to, uh, you know, come back to their normal. See how much space is in between these cardiac muscles usually, and these are the swollen muscles. It's going to rub and it's going to hurt. Um, three months of cardiac rest, but that does not mean strict bed rest. Um, so there we go. I'm going to let... All right, we're going to talk about dysrhythmias now. If you haven't taken a break, I would suggest you pause the program and take a break now. I hope you're not listening to this all the way through. I hope you're using the bookmarks. All right, for looking at dysrhythmias, we did cover the beginning of how to look at these 12 or these um, EKG strips back in the uh, cardiac, um, well, I believe it was the cardiac normals right after the preload, afterload section. Um, we talked about the normal rhythm strips and how to read the boxes and where the leads are reading and all that good stuff. But here is the actual dysrhythmias that I will expect you to remember. And then some bonus things for your knowledge on your own. I teach uh, reading EKGs a little differently than everybody else because I go to number one. Well, most everybody starts with the rate, um, and that's pretty explanatory. I think everybody has this by now by block four. 60 to 100 is normal. Less than 60 is a bradycardia. More than 100 is a tachycardia. But we're really just going to look at the rate because I'm gonna, I created a flow chart. If you like it, feel free to use it of um, how to sort these rhythms out. But the second step, instead of looking at the P wave that a lot of people teach you to look at the P wave, I'm going to take you to looking at the QRS interval first. The reason being is that if you can narrow some of these down, you don't need to interpret any further before you go to an intervention. Uh, so the QRS interval, narrow normal, remember we said one to three small boxes. So when we're looking at this EKG here, this is a large box. And this is a small box. So when we're talking about a normal narrow, we're talking about a QRS that is one to three small boxes. So with this one, we're starting it right here and we're ending it QRS when it gets back to the baseline. So I'm looking at about two small boxes. That's narrow and that is normal. And that means that everything's okay with atrial conduct or with ventricle conduction. Everything's A-OK -okay with ventricle conduction. So we're going to write this one. Ventricles, ventricle, OK. Because it's a normal narrow QRS, the ventricle is OK. That means the atrial is the problem, if there is a problem at all. So it's either normal to have a narrow QRS. So the ventricle is okay, check mark. That is either normal or it's atrial. Bottom line, if your QRS is normal and narrow, your rhythm is either normal or one of the atrial rhythms. That's pretty much, I mean, that's a nutshot. So... If your QRS is wide, 
I don't have a wide QRS on here, may, larger than three small boxes. So that would mean this QRS would have to start here. And it has to be greater than three small boxes. So one, two, three. It would have to end somewhere in here. You can see how much wider that would be. That would have to be starting to look like that. So if your QRS is getting wide or even wider than that, if your QRSs are wide, then you have a problem. Ventricle conduction is not okay. So it's a ventricle problem. So with a normal narrow QRS, your ventricle is okay. It's either a normal rhythm or an atrial rhythm. If it is wide, your ventricle conduction is not okay. So I like going to the QRS interval because then I can drop it with the rate into categories that you're going to see over here. This is what we're going to do. Rate is number one. And then we're going to look at the QRS width if it's narrow normal or the QRS width if it's wide and weird. Because look at this. It brings you right into your category. 60, you're going to treat it like a bradycardia. I don't care what kind of bradycardia it is. It doesn't matter if it's atrial or ventricular or normal or sinus. If it's less than 60, we need to treat it like a bradycardia. So that's why I look at the rate one, because I can knock some, right, some rhythms right off the bat. And uh, if the rate's less than 60, if the rate's over 60, then I need to look at that QRS width. Now we need to sort it to narrow normal or wide and weird, because if it's narrow normal, it's either normal sinus rhythm, or it's an atrial problem. We'll see why this one's an atrial problem. So we're going to just look at that for right now. I am not going to test you on heart blocks at all. I do have information on the heart blocks in this PowerPoint, but I will probably kind of gloss over it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. But the heart blocks will not be on the test. You will not have to identify a heart block. But if your QRS is narrow normal, you have one set of interventions. If your QRS is wide weird, you have another set of interventions. So just from going from steps one and two right here, the rate and the QRS interval, you have most of your decision making done. You don't have to get to the specific name. You can go and speak to your doctor and order interventions or anticipate interventions and let them interpret the EKG. I mean, smarter, not harder, right? But we're going to still go through it so that you have an idea. But I think that looking at the rate and the QRS interval can get you to an answer uh, if you don't want to wait to interpret. And that's important in nursing. Sometimes you don't want to wait to interpret. You want to start getting to your actions. So let's keep looking. If once we figure out where we're going, then we can look at this PR interval which right here starts at the beginning of the P and goes to the R, which is in the middle of the QRS. It's the PR interval. And I am not a very good drawer, but uh, this is normally three to five small boxes. So if we look at this PR interval, I mean, maybe I'll go to the other one since I made this one such a mess. We're gonna start this one here at the beginning of the P goes to this line here and then we're going to do one in the middle of the R which is at this line here and count the number of small boxes one two three four four small boxes so if that's four small boxes is that normal yes it is three to five so we're looking at that PR width if it's longer than five small boxes we have a heart block if the PR width varies from beat to beat. So we're going to look at a couple of beats in a row and see if they're around four small boxes. So this one, I scribbled real hard, but one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's four. We'll call that one four. We'll look at this one right here. This one starts at this line here. This is why nurses have a caliper 
to C, and then to the R is in between these two boxes here. And we have one, two, three, four. Yes. So this PR interval is even and does not vary from beat to beat. If the PR width varies from beat to beat, it's also a heart block. Uh, you can just call it a heart block and be done with it. Um, or sometimes there are no regular PR waves at all in between there. If you can't measure a, a, a PR width with each beat, there, it's a varied P waves. So you can kind of even clean yourself up a little bit by looking at the PR widths, because if you're interested in knowing if there's a heart block or not, that's where you will find it is in the PR widths. Is it regular? This doesn't really help you interpret at all. Just gives you an idea. Um, there are lots of bad rhythms that are regular, and there's lots of we don't really care rhythms that are irregular. So I wouldn't. I put that way down at the bottom. And then the QT width. We usually only look at the QT width when uh, we are giving medications that prolong cardiac conduction. The reason is the QT width, again, is from the beginning of the QRS to the end of this repolarization time. And if you give a med that prolongs the QT, meaning that it takes longer to repolarize, <coughs> excuse me, if you're giving a med that prolongs that and your patient gets um, an increased heart rate, they're repolarizing right when their next beat goes, and that could cause a lethal rhythm. So when we prolong QTs, um, we run a risk of arrhythmias. Uh, but most of the time, we don't measure the QT unless we're giving a med that prolongs the QT interval, because that gives us an increased risk of dysrhythmias as well. So I kind of explained to you my little uh, scribbles here. We're going to clear them now because I don't want you to look at this. So we're going to leave this here. We're going to go through them each by, uh, step by step. But this is a summary of everything in the next few slides about dysrhythmias. It's all summarized right here because um, I think the important part as a nurse is what are you going to do about these rhythms? And I am going to tell you that I don't really even care what your rhythm is. I am more interested and is your patient asymptomatic or symptomatic with whatever that rhythm is? I've had patients with heart rates of 50s who are perfectly fine. And I've had patients with heart rates of 110 that are dead. So really the important part is asymptomatic versus symptomatic. I, uh, you can read the rhythm later. <laughs> Uh, it, if you can get down to what do I need to do quickly, I think that will save you a lot of time. A lot of people think we're sitting there and pondering the rhythms. No, a lot of times we're going straight to action. So my summaries are going to get you to your quick actions and that you know what those actions are. And you won't know which way to go or what to recommend until you've checked on your patient. So any patient with an arrhythmia of any kind your first thought should be, oh, let me go see my patient and get a set of vital signs because you cannot go into this tree without seeing your patient because you won't know what your interventions are going to be. All right, looking at rhythms. We have, I started with the dead. We're going to go from worst to best or worst to least worrisome. Um, dysrhythmias that will kill you instantaneously our pulseless electrical activity, meaning you have a normal rhythm. Look at this. This is a normal. You could spend time. You could spend time counting all this stuff. The important part is no pulse and unresponsive. I've had a patient that I had that, you know, I was charting next to the bed and I was just talking to him and charting on the computer and I asked him a question and he didn't answer. And I looked up at the monitor and he looked fine. Monitor looks good. Um, he just had his heart rate on there. And so I was like, oh, George, I'm not, I don't know his name was George, 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 did you hear me? George, did you hear me? Hey, George, did you hear me? And I mean, by the time I went over there and did the Georgie, Georgie, are you okay? I'm looking at the monitor the whole time. He's in a regular normal rhythm. So I start getting the blood pressure going and I'm running the blood pressure and it occurs to me that Georgie's looking kind of funny, like he doesn't have the right color. And so I went to a carotid pulse and there was no pulse. 
So by the time I had spent looking at the computer, going to George, assessing whether he was okay, it was probably only about 30 seconds, but it felt like forever. And my monitor never let me know that my Georgie was no longer with us. Um, so if I need you to recognize pulses electrical activity on an exam, it will be any kind of rhythm, but it will say no pulse at the top of it because you won't know from the rhythm that your patient is dead. That's what makes it pulseless, dead, electrical activity. There's great electrical activity, but the heart is not moving. So pulseless electrical activity is always pulseless. It is a code blue. You cannot tell by a strip whether your patient is pulseless or not. Always go see your patient. Agonal is um, a rate less than 20 or something erratic or something not there at all. Um, agonal means um, abnormally slow, like agonal respirations are less than six. Um, agonal heart rates are less than 20. They are considered dead. They are considered asystole. Um, there is not any perfusible pumping going on with a rate of 20 um, or less. So electricity is not conducting, and this is a code blue pulseless rhythm as well. Uh, this is the ventricular rhythms. All right, let's take a look at them. Hey, they look kind of funny. So these, we could kind of tell what was going on asystole. You're like, oh, that's not good. Don't spend time looking at this. This rate is 20. Remember, I told you all the strips on your exam are going to be six-second strips. So all the strips that I'm showing you here, we're assuming are six-second strips. So if this is two beats there, that's an agonal rhythm. But we can take a look at it and measure it. Let's look at that QRS. It goes from about here to... QRS returns to the baseline. Okay, that's more than three to five small boxes. It's a ventricular rhythm. It's wide and weird. It's one to three. It's a that's a wide and weird rhythm. So it's ventricular. You don't even need to name it. It's ventricular, but we can also call it agonal because it's 20 or less. That's why it got put here. But when we're looking at these ventriculars, remember we said it could be any rate, so that doesn't help you figure anything out. But remember we said go to that QRS interval next. Next, it is greater than Smith three small boxes. It is wide. You can count these if you want, but if this, they're even hard to tell where the Q, let's just say the QRS, QRS, they are definitely wider than three small boxes. Oh, yeah. These boys, I don't even have to tell, count to tell you those are wider than three small boxes. So they are wide. There are no P waves to measure PR with. I agree. Regular, um, it could. Yes, it varies. Even if we could tell, um, yeah, that's varied. There's a short ones and maybe. These, I don't even know what to do with these. These don't make any sense whatsoever. But if we're starting to read them, you could go Q, R, S, and we're at one, two, three, four, and then we got Q, R, S. So you can see that these are Q, R. This one might be normal. This one, don't spend time working about it. Most of them are weird. Most of them are wide. They are wide. They're a ventricular problem. But the thing that's going to make it between ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia is the fact that it is irregular. This one you could make an argument, but it is not the same width for each QRS, so it is not regular. This one, these are definitely not regular. So wide, irregular, wide, irregular, we're calling it fibrillation, okay? Ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is always pulseless. And this is why I'm telling you don't spend time assessing your rhythms. Go see your patient first. You can assess the rhythm later. Um, go see your pulse. Go see your patient. V-fib is always pulseless. Your patient probably won't look very good. Um, but if you wanted to sit down and read your rhythms later, this is why it fell into the V-fib category. The V-tac category, wide and regular. You can make a you can make a regular. You can see that these beats are beating regularly. They're not fibrillating like over here. These there's nothing regular about these beats. You might be able to, we might be able to call that one regular. Um but it's not 
the same QRS each time. See how the QRSs are changing? So it's not really regular. Huh? You, you can't call that regular. This one, though, look at how these QRSs are the same each time. Um, this one here might also be polymorphic VTAC. Doesn't really matter. Read the rhythm later. Patient might be dead. Um, my, so if you are looking at this one, it is wide and we're calling it regular. So wide and regular ventricular tachycardia. The wide irregular ventricular dysrhythmia. Um, do you have ventricular regular rhythms that aren't tachycardia, like ventricular regular? Uh, yes, we do. They are called um, ventricular rhythms or junctional rhythms. But yes, we do. But the ones we're worried about for you to recognize is ventricular tachycardia. Um, ventricular, because it's wide, all of these are wider and bigger than three small boxes, and um, it is regular. There are no P waves to measure the PR width. Uh, this is a tachycardia. This ventricle could be could be moving blood. It might not be moving blood. If the ventricle is moving blood, it's moving blood at a very fast rate. Uh, go check the patient. Ventricular tachycardia could be pulsed. It could be pulseless. Um, so you need to go check your patient. I'm just telling you how to recognize them on these slides. Um, the premature ventricular contraction is a wide, weird beat in the middle of uh, a bunch of normal narrow beats. So you can see where they are circled here. There are random, wide, weird QRSs in the middle of a bunch of normal narrow QRSs. That is a ventricular beat. Um, that is just a random ventricular beat, and there's nothing more to worry about other than the fact that it's random. Um, too many PVCs can reduce the cardiac output if those beats are not pulsed. Uh, and the fact is, if you're having a lot of pre vent premature ventricular contractions, it means the ventricle is irritable and trying to take over control from the atrium pacemaker, and it could become a ventricular rhythm. So we want to keep an eye on them. But basically, these are beats that have just gone on their own, not waiting for the pacemaker to stimulate a beat. That's why the QRS looks normal. The ventricle went ahead and conducted by itself, and that's why it is a wide wheel ventricular beat. Atrial rhythms. Atrial rhythms are, look at all those QRSs. Look at all these beautiful, normal, narrow QRSs. I'm not saying the rhythm is normal, but look, this is one small box. This is one, two small boxes. This one's one small box. Yeah, these are normal and these are narrow. They might not be completely normal, but I am f happy with how the ventricle is responding here. My ventricle is okay. So all of these um, atrial rhythms that we are going to talk about from here on out are going to have those nice, narrow, normal QRSs. So the first one we're going to look at, this is a rate. Superior, supraventricular tachycardia. Now, why they called it supraventricular when you're like, this is a ventricular rhythm. No, no, it's not a ventricular rhythm. Supra means above. So it's an above ventricular tachycardia. Why in the world? Above ventricular tachycardia. What's above the ventricle? Why didn't they just call it atrial tachycardia? Probably didn't sound as fancy. Probably didn't get as much attention. But above ventricle means atrial. Oh, it's atrial tachycardia, guys. But it's supraventricular. It's above the ventricle tachycardia. Okay, I don't know. It's a freaking atrial tachycardia, guys. Atrial tachycardia, it has nothing to do with the ventricle at all other than they put the name supra in front of ventricular instead of the word atrial just to mess up nursing students and med students for the rest of their existence. Supraventricle tachycardia is atrial 
tachycardia. And it is a super tachycardia because it's more than 150 beats per minute. You don't get the word, um, and I guess they don't want to call it atrial tachycardia because they should have called it atrial super tachycardia. That's what we should call it. Do you think we should just, um, I should send a, a petition to the board, you know, the, who would, who would rename a rhythm? I'll have to look at that. Atrial super tachycardia, not supraventricular. Get the word ventricle out of it. The ventricle's fine. Atrial super tachycardia is the name of this. Um, yeah, SVT. It's supraventricular tachycardia. It's also known as RVR. Rapid ventricular rate. This is probably a more um, medical term. That's probably what they wanted to call it instead of atrial. But it's still got the word ventricular and it still confuses people. Um, I, so I don't like it. It has nothing to do with the poor ventricle. This is a rapid ventricular rate. The ventricle is responding to the rapid atrial tachycardia. Just freaking call it atrial super tachycardia. Somebody petition that if that, um, you know, you can copyright it to me. Thank you very much. Atrial super tachycardia is really SVT, also known as RVR for rapid ventricular rate or rapid, rapid ventricular response. Um, either way, they should have named it atrial super tachycardia. So when you see a narrow normal rhythm, it's either normal or it's an atrial problem. And we know this is not normal to have a heart rate greater than 150. So it is an atrial dysrhythmia. It's too fast to see any P waves. So we can just go right, it's super tachy. QRS, it's normal narrow, it's something atrial. It's atrial tachycardia again. Um, it's super fast. So the reason that this is a problem is that once your heart rate is over 150, you really can't perfuse out to the body. Um, if you've ever uh, gotten your heart rate up during exercise to 180, 200, maybe 240, um, how did you feel? I bet you felt breathless. I bet you felt a little dizzy. How long did you maintain your heart rate at that rate? You probably can't maintain it for more than 10 minutes at that rate. Otherwise, you will get breathless and you could pass out. That's exactly what people are doing here. They just didn't exercise to get there. All of a sudden, they are breathless, feeling like they're going to pass out and their heart is beating 100 times a minute because it is, or 150 times a minute. This is an atrial tachycardia. It's super fast. It decreases perfusion because it is too fast. Um, this atrium firing a super fast rate um, the, causes an inadequate emptying of the atrium. So bloods can clot there. While this heart is beating, 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 blood is still returning to the heart, but it's beating so fast that it can't fill and blood is starting to back up, causing um, or increased risk of blood clots. And then when we... Um, when we shock them or give them medicine to slow their heart rate down, when that contractility slows down, those clots could blow through. So any atrial rhythm, the other thing I want you to remember is that um, there's an increased risk of stroke whenever the atrium does not empty adequately. So atrial dysrhythmias cause an increased risk of stroke. So atrial super tachycardia um, is an atrial dysrhythmia, and it's usually symptomatic. Atrial fibrillation, again, it rate, uh, I don't know, it could be anything. Could be 80, could be 110, could be 120. It's not more than 150 because after it's 150, we call it uh, SVT. QRS interval is normal narrow, so we know it's an atrial problem. Um, I can't really tell the PRs. Don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out, is this the P? Is this the P? Is this the P? Is this the P? Don't, don't. If you cannot see a steady, good, repeatable P, just stop. Just stop. We already said it's narrow normal. We know the ventricle's okay. Don't try to interpret a P that isn't there. This atrium is fibrillating. It is not conducting nicely around the atrium the way it is supposed to. It is just vibrating. 
The atrium is just vibrating. The atrium is fibrillating. It's not doing anything other than vibrating, so blood has to spill in there without an atrial squeeze. Um, so the ventricles don't feel quite as well as they would without the atrium working. Um, and also there's an increased risk of clots. This is also an irregular rhythm. Basically the pacemaker node is fibrillating. So there isn't any good conduction around the atrium and the ventricle is trying to follow whatever electrical signals it's getting. So it's not really sure and it becomes very irregular. Um, so just basically any rate, but if it's normal and narrow, you can't figure out the P waves, but some are flat, some are different heights, can't be found, there's nothing regular, just call it fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. If things are irregular and you cannot tell that they are regular, just call them fibrillating and be done with it. This is a fibrillating atrium and then ventricle is okay. It is atrial fibrillation. This is atrial flutter, which they should have called atrial tachycardia too, because look at what this atrium is doing. This atrium has repeatable P's. I mean, some of them, like, we're not really sure what's going on with that one. But otherwise, these P's are pretty repeatable. You can say they all are. Maybe they're diminishing each time. But they are pretty repeatable. And they look like P waves. They look like each other. You could say this is a T wave and these are two P waves. Either way, it's two repeatable P waves. There are more P waves than there should be. But the rate could be any rate. It is a normal narrow rhythm, so it's an atrial dysrhythmia of some kind. And to figure it out, we could just call it atrial and be done with it, or we can figure it out. If there are two or more of the same looking sawtooth P waves before each QRS, then it's a fibrillation because the atrium is just fibrillating. I mean, not fibrillating, it's fluttering, fluttering. It is fluttering, which means it is tachycardic and it's not squeezing appropriately. So they decided to call it flutter. Um, it's just basically atrial tachycardia, but the ventricle is blocking. The ventricle recognizes that it shouldn't follow each one. Can you imagine what it would be if the ventricle followed each one? If the ventricle followed each one, we would call this a rapid ventricular response or a super fast tachycardia. When they get super fast, they become SVT. But this is atrial flutter because the ventricle is still blocking some of it. We will call this a three to one because every third beat gets through the ventricle or the AV node is taking care of blocking through the tachycardia. When it is not blocking through the tachycardia, look how fast it gets. Um, sometimes when this one, when the P wave gets so much and the ventricle is tired of figuring out how fast to go and it follows everything it sees, it gets super fast. So a fib and a flutter can turn into SVT. But when they are a flutter, they have recognizable P waves. A fib does not have recognizable P waves. Um, a flutter, a fib. And you just need to recognize them. Then there's these premature atrial contractions. Basically, these are normal narrow, so we know it's something atrial. Um, there are P waves, though. Remember, with AFib and A-flutter, there were recognizable fluttering P waves. This one is like, oh, here's a P wave. Here's a P wave. Here's a P wave. Here's a P wave. Here's a P... Oh, well, that was fast. Here's a P wave. You, they have P waves. They are premature atrial contractions, meaning they just come up sooner than they should. That's the only difference between them. There is just a regular beat sooner than it should be. It is a, um, I don't want to say, it's like a palpitation. It's just a one-off. Um, we don't worry too much about them. Um, too many PACs could become an atrial fibrillation or an atrial flutter, but premature atrial contractions, they're just normal beats, just a little bit early. Um, these are the Brady's. Um, if you want to go ahead and skip ahead to interventions, you can. I will not ask you for the test to recognize anything other than a sinus bradycardia. Um, but the blocks, remember we talked about once you get down to the rate into the um, after you figured out that it's narrow and normal, we start looking at the PR interval. And this PR interval, we'll go to from P to the R, way longer than the three to five small boxes that it's supposed to be. 
This one's way longer than the three to five boxes it's supposed to be. Way longer than the three to five. Oh, I made it too short. But anyway, we get the point. It's regular, but it's just really big. Everything is normal except the PR interval is longer than normal. Um, you can have AV blocks at any rate, but we only treat them when they get slow. That's why I put them here. Um, if they are at a rate of... Oh, here, I'm going to get rid of all my horrible misspellings. Um, it would help if I went back to the PowerPoint. But if, um, yeah, if, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. So sorry. Um, if the PR interval is longer than three to five small boxes and everything else is regular, uh, you know, and the rate is 80 or 90 or 70 and the patient's perfusing, we're just going to monitor it. A first degree AV block, if it's a normal rate, we're just going to monitor it. It's under the dysrhythmia section because we only worry about it when it becomes a bradycardia. So blocks I put under bradycardias because that's when we worry about them. The second degree AV block is basically the PR interval gets longer and longer and longer with each beat and then it drops. So if you look at this one, let's blow this up. Let's use a different color that isn't so red. Um, the PR interval, so we're gonna start it here to here and here to here. Oops, one more over. Here to here, you can see how much longer it got. So we have normal, short, longer, longer, and then all of a sudden a missing QRS. And then we go short, longer, and then this one would be even longer. So basically the, Q, the PR interval gets gradually longer and then you drop a beat. With second degree, so both of the second degree intervals, the PR interval um, and a QRS is dropped. This one, the PR interval gets longer. This one, the PR interval stays normal. So the PR interval gradual lengthening. This is PR interval normal. But both of them have a dropped QRS. So this one drops where these P, if you measured out these PR intervals, they would be exactly the same. They wouldn't have gradual lengthening. PR intervals would be exactly the same and then a dropped QRS. This one gets longer, 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 drop. Then you have a winky box. But they're both second degree because both of them involve a dropped QRS. The first degree, go back to the other one. Sorry. There we go. The first degree, the PR intervals, there's no dropped QRS. It's regular. Just the PR is long. The second degree, there's a dropped QRS. <coughs> you have to look at the QRS intervals to see which kind of second degree you have. <coughs> Third degree is real hard to figure out because you want to look at it. It doesn't follow any of the rules. But if you look at the PR intervals, you'll have... We're going to go here. Then we have PR. They are varying. <coughs> and you could say, okay, longer, 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 but you never have a drop. There's no drop QRS, so it can't be second degree. The PR intervals, some of them are wide, but some of them are short. But remember, first degree was regular. First degree, the PR interval is regular. It's just big. Second degree, there's a dropped QRS. There's no dropped QRS. This is not following any of the rules. Third degree is kind of hard to figure out because it doesn't follow any rules, but I will show you what it's doing here. This is also called complete heart block. It's also called AV disassociation. And I like AV disassociation because that describes what's going on here. The atrium and the ventricle are doing their own thing. Notice this QRS. Oop. Look at this QRS. Oh, stop 
moving. Okay, look at this QRS. We're going to start it right... Let me get one that starts on a line here. This one's starting on a line. This one's starting right here. And where is it coming back to the baseline? Look at that. It's wide. It's weird. It's ventricular. Oh, my goodness. It's a ventricular rhythm. And then you have these atriums. If you look at this R to R, which are ventricular beats, but if you look at these R to Rs, they are regular. This is a regular ventricular beat. The ventricle's doing its own thing. It's doing a pretty good job. It's pretty regular. But it is a ventricle beat. It's not a ventricle tachycardia, because look at the rate of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a normal ventricular beat. It's a normal ventricular running at 80. It's doing a great job. The problem is the ventricle's running the show. What's the atrium doing behind the scenes? It thinks it's running the show. P to P to P to P. These are all the same length. To P, uh-oh, where'd the P go? Well, it turns out the P is right in between. Let's see. So this is one large block plus two. So this is two plus one. So we're going to say this is where this next P should be. And then we have one large block plus two. This is where the next P. This P got buried in the QRS. And then we measure one block plus two. Yep, that's where the next P starts. So what you're seeing is you're measuring. This is a regular P to P and a regular R to R. They're just not talking to each other. They're living in the same house, but they no longer talk to each other. They are disassociated. So third degree heart block means that the atrium thinks it's in charge, but the ventricle is doing its own thing. The um, SA node is firing, but the AV node is dead. It's not conducting in between them. The danger of this rhythm is the ventricle is not a very good pacemaker. It won't stay regular for long. And um, when the ventricle gets tired, there's no, there's no backup. Usually when the atrial gets tired, the ventricle backs up. But when the ventricle gets tired um, and this AV is not talking to it, um, it's in the risk of, um, of becoming a, a, either a bradycardia, a complete bradycardia, or the rhythm stopping altogether. So third degree heart block, there you go. Um, these are just some pictures of um, slow uh, junctional rhythms. Junctional rhythms are where the AV node is okay. The AV node became the pacemaker. How do we know the AV node became the pacemaker? It's because the QRS is narrow. So it looks like the ventricle is okay and everything's okay, but whoops. Where's the P wave? Where's the P wave? There's no P waves. The P waves, the SA node and the AV node, or the SA node is gone. There's no AV node. No, or sorry, no SA node to create a P wave. So the SA node died. The AV node became the pacemaker. So the QRS looks exactly the same because the QRS usually gets its, its uh, instructions from the AV node. The QRS doesn't go until the AV node tells it to go. So it's used to looking at the AV node. So the QRS looks narrow and normal. The problem is um, the fact that the P wave is completely gone in a junctional rhythm. That means the AV node is the junction between the uh, SA node and the ventricle. So the junction became in charge. We recognize it because there is absolutely no P wave. It's not a fibrillation. It's not a flutter. There is absolutely no atrial activity going on at all. So basically the atrium is dead and the AV node became in charge. The ventricular rhythms, which are wide and weird with no P wave, means the AV node is gone too. So there's no SA and no AV nodes. So the SA pacemaker and the AV pacemaker are gone. 
And that's what makes it a ventricular rhythm. The ventricle has to pace make itself. And ventricles aren't very good at pace making themselves. So um, those are ventricular rhythms versus junctional rhythms. They can be regular rates. They can be slow rates. If this becomes a tachycardia, oops. If this becomes a tachycardia, it would become VTAC. Um, if it's a Brady, it's, uh, it, it's a slow ventricular or a ventricular rhythm. So those are just some other bradycardias you might see. None of these will be on the test. The only one on the test is sinus bradycardia. The rest of this was for your information. So if you didn't want to know about it, you can get rid of it out of your brain. The important part after all recognizing all these rhythms, and I say before you name the rhythm, go see your patient. Do this before naming the EKG, okay? Do this before. Do it, all right? Don't sit at the nurse's station and interpret EKGs if there's something you're worried about. Go and see your patient. Okay, I got so excited. Okay, what you need to do is decide is your patient asymptomatic or symptomatic with any dysrhythmia. If they are asymptomatic, they're like, I don't know, I don't feel anything. Or maybe they'll tell you they have palpitations. Their blood pressure is good. They don't have shortness of breath. Their SATs are good. They're not dizzy or ready to fall. So check a blood pressure, check a SAT, and ask them if they're dizzy or weak. Um, you can also see if they're having chest pain or shortness of breath. A symptomatic rhythm means the heart is not perfusing with that rhythm. So asymptomatic means everything's being chill. Symptomatic means the heart is not perfusing. This is a worsening condition. So having a rhythm is not necessarily an emergency. Having a dysrhythmia is not necessarily an emergency. If your heart's doing okay with it, we will watch it. So this is probably your number one step is going to see your patient. The other thing you can do is this is, has a pulse and this has no pulse. So if you go in, the minimum you do is if they're at a pulse, then you check these two. If there's no pulse, you go to CPR. If your patient's talking to you, you don't have to do a pulse check, but if they're not talking to you, do a pulse check first. Um, but then if they have a pulse, see if they're asymptomatic versus symptomatic. Um, that will guide you to what to do. These are the things to monitor. Not surprisingly, they're heart monitors. Okay. Ventricular dysrhythmias, because the ventricle is having a problem, we would probably want to do something to decrease its irritability or to decrease its, um, its getting... What's the, what was the word I'm looking for? Getting antsy. This is kind of the ventricle getting antsy and being like, I can take over, I can take over, um, I can do what I want. And those are not things we want it to do because the ventricle is not supposed to be the pacemaker. Um, so uh, go see your patient. If they have any ventricular dysrhythmias, whether it's beats of VTAC or entire run of VTAC, uh, we will call these little things runs. A VTAC. This is a four beat run. This is a two beat run, two beat run. This is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beat run. So the longer and more frequent they are, the more irritable this ventricle is. Any of these beat runs could turn into a long run of VTAC. The important thing though is go check your patient. They could be asymptomatic. I've had patients where each one of these ventricular beats perfuses just as good and sometimes better than some of these crappy little normal beats. So some of these ventricular beats, this patient doesn't even know they're different. Um, so check your patient. If they are asymptomatic, because their ventricle is so irritable, we still want to keep them kind of quiet and monitor them very, very closely. Do make sure you're doing their cardiac labs. If they want medications, then antidysrhythmics would be amiodarone and lidocaine. So for ventricular dysrhythmias, the meds are amiodarone. and lidocaine. Oop, my pen went out. So amiodarone and lidocaine are, are meds for any ventricular arrhythmia. So the doctor can choose them if they want. If you're worsening cues, meaning they are symptomatic or they don't have a good blood pressure with any of these beats, 
put oxygen on them. They could do amiodarone and lidocaine because those are the meds for them. But this patient may become unstable and they may have to do cardioversion. So we will talk about cardioversion. Every one of these, so ventricle dysrhythmias has an electricity, a uh, atrial rhythm has electricity, bradycardias have electricity, but ventricular arrhythmias, the electricity for if they are symptomatic and have a pulse is synchronized cardioversion. If your patient has a pulse, you're cardioverting. If they don't have a pulse, you're defibrillating. It is the same machine. It's the same delivery. There is one button difference between the two, and they are very important. But cardioversion is for a patient with a pulse. Defibrillation is for a patient without a pulse. So those patients will get cardioversion. Every intervention, again, has medications and electricity. Usually doctors, and there's a little asterisk, usually doctors choose to use medicines before dragging out electricity and delivering cardioversions or shocks um, because cardioversions are the same as defibrillations. They're just timed better. So, um, and they're usually done at a lower voltage. Um, but the patient is awake for them because they have a pulse. So they are pretty high interventions. And so you will try medicines before. But I don't want you to ever tell a doctor, you haven't given a med, so I'm not going to use electricity. Electricity is a medicine just like a medicine. And so the doctor can choose to use electricity first. That is his right. It is appropriate for the rhythm. So just so you know, ventricular dysrhythm me as the medicine is amiodarone and lidocaine and the electricity is cardioversion if they have a pulse. Atrial dysrhythmias, they have medicine as well and but the medicines don't really, there's different medicines for asymptomatic and different medicines for symptomatic. So you got to go see your patient in order to know what to do for your patient. If they are asymptomatic, you just have them rest more while they're being evaluated. Make sure that they don't get into worsening cues, but just check them, check, keep their oxygenation and their blood pressure under monitor. Make sure you do your cardiac testing. And if the doctor wants to do medications for it, because if it's a new rhythm, you're going to call the doctor anyway. If the doctor wants to give medications for it, um, he will give in patients that are asymptomatic usually anticoagulation because when a patient is having an atrial dysrhythmia they are an increased risk of uh atrial uh increased risk of stroke all atrial dysrhythmia dysrhythmias have an increased risk of stroke so you should have an anticoagulant in any patient with an atrial dysrhythmia and they probably have a prn heart rate control medicine to keep it less than 140. A lot of atrial dysrhythmias, because the ventricle is trying to figure out what the atrium is doing, they are a little bit faster, and we usually try to keep them less than 140 so that the heart is still able to perfuse the body, because the faster the heart gets, the less it can perfuse. So there will be a PRN heart rate control or a scheduled heart rate control med. It will either be a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. For worsening cues of an atrial dysrhythmia, so you find an AFib, a flutter, an SVT um, that is a, that is symptomatic, meaning they have a lower blood pressure, a decreased oxygenation, diaphoresis, uncomfortable. They will get some oxygen because they have a decreased oxygenation. They will, if you have a super fast atrial tachycardia, maybe over 150, have them bear down. That's what vagal maneuvers is. Um, you can say, hey, you know, bear down like you're going to the bathroom. I just say, hold your breath. It's a lot easier to do and it doesn't invoke um, poop fairies. So I just say, hold your breath, hold your breath for two seconds. <gasps> and just have them try to bear down a little bit because that stimulates your vagus nerve, which slows down your heart. So if you're having a super fast rhythm, you can try a vagal maneuver for your patient. The medications though are definitely an anticoagulant still. They're still at risk and increased of stroke. Um, heart rate control, again, this one, it's not so much that PRN, you're fast, go ahead and give them beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. But if you they want to control the arrhythmia, the only one that will work is amiodarone for an atrial rhythm, amiodarone. Why is adenosine here? Adenosine is for SVT only, or that atrial super tachycardia, the one that's over 150, adenosine stops the heart. 
it literally stops the heart for 6 to 12 seconds. That's a long time for your heart to stop. Um, it is a pretty big intervention. So I don't want you to think it's, oh, it's like a, it's an anti-inflammatory. No, it's big. It stops the heart. We only use it. Um, it's on the same par as a cardioversion. It's a chemical cardioversion. So adenosine is not for treating arrhythmias. <laughs> it's for slowing the heart down when it is super, super tachycardic. So I don't want you to think it is used in long-term treatment of any kind of medication. It is an emergency treatment. Um, I did put it under here because, you know, worsening cues could be an emergency. Um, so adenosine is a super special med and it's only for those super atrial tachycardias. You do not give adenosine if you have wide weird QRSs. Do not, do not, do not. The heart won't restart again. <laughs> you have to have that SA node to restart your heart. So if you give adenosine to a ventricular tachycardia, um, it will stop the heart and it probably won't restart again. Um, adenosine is only for those narrow normal QRSs where the atrium is the problem because we are trying to restart the SA node. It's basically jump starting the SA node. So adenosine, um, and then they could choose cardioversion and Instead of adenosine, this is not a one, two, three list. This is a menu of options, these um, medications and electricity. Menus of options, the doctors can pick and choose which one they want to use first. Um, I would say it would be inappropriate to give adenosine or cardioversion to an asymptomatic atrial rhythm. That would be inappropriate. And it's not on the menu of options for an asymptomatic atrial rhythm. So you have to know which one your patient is to know what menu to choose from. But anything off of the menu is fine. Do not quibble with the doctor about orders. This is not really a one, two, three list. Um, these are just options. This uh, is just a quick difference between cardioversion and... Well, this is cardioversion. I have defibrillation later in the code blue piece because I want you to separate cardioversion. Cardioversion goes with the medications. Cardioversion goes with the interventions here. Defibrillation goes with code blue. Cardioversion is used when the patient has a pulse. Um, it is an electrical reset of the heart. You can see right here, maybe this is a, a flutter that's going too fast, whatever the patient has to be unstable or symptomatic. You're not going to shock or cardiovert someone uh, who is stable. So basically this is where you shoot the electricity and it kind of stuns the SA node and then the SA node resets and you have P waves again. Yay! That's what we wanted. So um, that's what cardioversion should do. That's what we want it to do. And um, because it is shocking the patient, you should sedate the patient first. Um, I'm going to let you, if you have the PowerPoint, go to the real life cardioversion or you can search it on YouTube. Um, I will put the link in the comments. Uh, but go ahead and watch the real life cardioversion. It is a shock to the patient, but the important part the important part, the important part is that it's synchronized. That's why it's in the name, synchronized. It is synchronized cardioversion because you're trying to reset the heart, but it is synchronized to the heartbeat. You will see a um, beat above it. And that means that it is reading the QRS because if you deliver a shock, while the heart is resetting, if you deliver a shock in the QRS here at the end of the QRS, your patient could go into a V-fib or a cardiac arrest if you deliver a shock in the wrong part of the rhythm when the patient has a pulse. When the patient is pulseless, there is no rhythm to to match with. So there is no sync. But when the patient has a pulse, you need to sync the rhythm before you throw shock at the heart. Um, so it is synchronized cardioversion and um, it is done for atrial dysrhythmias and for ventricular dysrhythmias if they want to. Synchronized cardioversion is the electricity that could reset those rhythms. 
bradycardias. Um, so we did one for ventricular, one for atrial, one for bradycardias. If they are asymptomatic, we're mostly just going to watch them and monitor them because they're asymptomatic and we will wait to see if they become symptomatic or if they're just fine with that rhythm. I know a lot of athletes that have heart rates in the 50s when they're resting. That's perfectly normal for them. Their hearts are really strong and can pump out a lot with each beat and um, they're healthy. So if they're asymptomatic, we're not going to bother them. We'll just monitor them. Uh, if they are having worsening cues, meaning they are having shortness of breath, decreased oxygenation, um, palpitations, um, decreased blood pressure, we will do these cues. We're going to give them oxygen. Any patient that is having decreased oxygenation deserves oxygen. Um, the medications for bradycardias are not amiodarone, but another AMED, atropine. So amiodarone is great for atrial and ventricular rhythms. Um, the atrial rhythms also have that extra atrial med. Two atriums got two A meds. We have amiodarone. We have that adenosine for emergency backup. Um, for the ventricular rhythms, we have amiodarone and we have lidocaine as a backup. So those are our meds there. In bradycardias, we only have one A med. It's atropine. And um, we have dopamine and we have epinephrine. Those three things will aid the heart rate, will up the right heart, will make it faster. Um, atropine makes the heart faster by blocking the rest digest nerve, the vagus nerve, and it um, will block the vagus nerve. And so the heart never gets told to rest and slow down. It will ramp up a little bit from sympathetic stimulation. So atropine will block the vagus nerve. Dopamine physically increases the contractility and heart rate of the heart. And epi stimulates the heart because it's adrenaline. Um, those are the three meds that we would use for bradycardias, mostly atropine. And if the doctor decides that maybe the atropine or the dopamine or the epi are not the meds that he wants to use, um, he can use go straight to a pacemaker. Pacemaker is the electricity for bradycardias. We do not cardiovert bradycardias. We do not defibrillate bradycardias. We pace bradycardias. We want to bring them up. We will pace them faster. I do have some, inter some interesting information about pacemakers. I will not have you read pacemaker rhythms on the exam, but should you want to go through it, it is right here in front of you for to read. Um, and these might be something you might want to reference if you're working on a cardiac floor or ask more information if what's on here isn't enough. There is some basic information on troubleshooting that I gave to my ICU nurses. Um, again, don't worry about this unless you are working with a pacemaker or will be. I think it will be a great reference, um, but I am happy to come and see you. This will not be on the exam, but it is great information if you want it. Um, pulseless rhythms. Again, this is not going to be on the exam. You've been tested on code blue before, but this is a nice little, maybe if you want to make it into a flashcard or something, it is a nice thing to keep you straight or a badge buddy, you know, for the steps that you need to do. Um, if you are non-ACLS, you are doing the first six steps and the first six steps only. Once you are ACLS, you will be managing the code drugs and trying to figure out the causes, the H's and T's. Not testing you on any of this, but it is a good um, reference card if you'd like. Um, this is about defibrillation. Again, all you need to know about defibrillation is it's asynchronous. You can shock at any time, and it's usually higher electricities. This is for non-pulsed people. Pulsed people get cardioverted and synchronous with their heart rate. Pulseless people don't have a heart rate to synchronize, so we just shock them or we defibrillate them. They are both shocks, cardioversion and defibrillation. Cardioversion is synced. Defibrillation is just asynchronous or defibrillating, just going. Um, but they placed the same. This is just some information. I will probably not put it on the exam either, but in case you get a case or anything on NCLEX, I did want to point out that there is life after a code. When patients um, get a pulse back, 
Nobody really thinks about what happens when you get a pulse back. But when you get a pulse back, honestly, it is maintain oxygenation, get in an airway, get on a ventilator, maintain blood pressure. They'll continue fluids and give vasopressors or inotropes to maintain a blood pressure. And then they will determine if they have... Um, What's their mental status? Are they following commands? Are they uh, not following commands? If they're not following commands, either way, if there's a MI, conscious and unconscious patients go into the cath lab. Um, if they don't have an MI, conscious and unconscious patients go into the ICU. But uh, one will get, the unconscious patient will go for hypother hypothermia, which is controlled hypothermia, where we will cool the blood um, down to about 36 degrees and keep the patient in suspended animation for about 24 hours to allow everything to kind of heal and not go into shock after big damage to the heart like a code is. So that's just an information on return of spontaneous circulation. Um, if your patient has dysrhythmias or is going home, um, knowing they have a dysrhythmia, uh, you know, just basically let them know if they've had multiple episodes of bradycardias, they're probably going to get a pacemaker. It could be permanent. Um, if patients have had multiple episodes of ventricular arrhythmias, they are recommended to have a defibrillator. Um, and, you know, if they need pacers, defibrillators, cardioverting, if they have internal implanted devices, the patient should always carry a card for that device in their wallet. Because when they arrive in the hospital, we usually have questions for the implanting company, you know, whether it's an implant for, uh, you know, uh, insulin pump, or we usually need to call those companies and find out what kind of pump it is, what special directions we need for that pump. Um, if it's a pacemaker or a defibrillator, we like to have Medtronic or whoever it is come and interrogate to get the settings off of that. We don't have magic tools that tells us what that pacemaker does. So those cards are very valuable to healthcare employees and patients should carry them. Um, and then if they did have a dysrhythmia, what caused it and what can they do to avoid it? <clears throat> this is a, a myocardial infarction refresher. Again, not on the exam, so just cross that out. This is here for information if you want it. Um, if you have questions about it, follow up with me. Um, 12 lead EKG, again, not on the exam. So you can go ahead and clear this, but if, you have inter if you're interested, this is a little bit more information about it. Um, you do need to know though that a 12 lead EKG um, is a one-time exam. Please don't think it's continuous monitoring. I've had a couple people ask for 12 lead EKGs when they meant um, continuous monitoring or telemetry boxes. 12 lead monitoring is a one-time exam that they have to come and hook up leads on a chest, get a printout or sent to the computer. Um, so that's not continuous. This again is, um, again, not on the exam. So go ahead and skip through it. This is for people who want more information. Um, I think it's really nice to know where in the heart we're looking at, and that's a big part of the 12 lead EKG. So um, again, if you want more information on 12 lead EKG, come see me. I will probably have a supplemental class, or if I ever link to one, I will um, put a comment in the comment section if I link to my 12 lead EKG class. Take a break, take a break, take a break. You're back for endocardium disorders. If you're back for endocardium disorders, if you're starting in this section, I really want you to have done the drawing section at the beginning because that will go over where the valves are and um, what order they're in. This, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, and we're not going to talk a lot about the signs and symptoms because the signs and symptoms are heart, right and left heart failure, and we reviewed that back in the heart failure and the drawing section. So if you're starting here, that's my disclaimer. Go back and look at those two sections. Otherwise, let's in, go into the endocardium, which is the inner lining of the heart. The inner lining of the heart includes the valves and the insides of the blood vessels. Um, this is where, because we're going to talk about valves, this is where we're going to talk about those abnormal heart sounds because that's valve problems. 
Um, we did talk about S3, S4 in heart failure. I will discuss those in here. So if you are coming here from the heart failure lecture to listen to those, they are in here. After we talk about abnormal heart sounds and valve disorders, we will talk a little bit about an infection of the endocardial lining. And then we're going to bring in aortic aneurysms because that's the inside lining of the aorta, which is an extension of the endocardium. So again, if we are confused about the endocardium, it is the lining. So I'm going to draw it. This is the lining on the inside, the endo part of the heart. And because it includes the valve linings, it includes all the valves. So this is all endocardium. And you can see that that does extend into our vessels. So this will include the aortic aneurysms. So that's what the endocardium is there. Um, I am not spending any time on this slide because I did that in the drawing section at the beginning. Uh, I will mention that this is vocabulary. This is vocabulary, but you will need it. Stenosis means that the valve is stuck shut. So this is stenosis means stuck shut. Regurgitation means stuck open. And so when it's stuck open, blood regurgitates. And when it's stuck shut, blood has resistance. So when the valve is stuck shut, blood can't get out. It backs up in the ventricle before the valve. When it's regurgitating, the valve doesn't close. So when the other valve is supposed to be ejecting out, some regurgitates or burps back into the valve that was supposed to be shut off. Because these don't work right, um, they cause different problems. But stenosis means stuck shut. Regurgitation means stuck open. Um, the diastolic gallop, those S3, S4s we were talking about, those are those vibrations heard, they're diastolic murmurs. Stenosis could be, a, or if, could be systolic or diastolic. Regurgitation could be systolic or diastolic. A diastolic gallop is heard only in diastole, and it sounds a little bit different, but it, it's not, uh, it's not, how it sounds that makes it different, it's where it's heard that makes it different. Stenosis is heard over the affected valve area. So it's only heard in one spot in the heart. This is heard over multiple spots. So it's the same sound, really, but it's where you hear it that changes it. If you hear it strongly in one spot and not in others, it is a valve problem, and it's either stenosis or regurgitation. So if you hear it in one spot only, it's either stenosis or regurgitation. One spot is a valve problem, and you hear it over the valve spot. So if you only hear it in one spot when you listen... And we're going to go over the spots to listen. But when you hear it in one spot, it's a valve issue. And where you hear it the loudest is the valve involved. Stenosis means that valve is stuck shut. And regurgitation means that valve is stuck open. If you hear this weird sound in multiple areas when you listen, so that means it's all over the heart, it is a heart failure problem. You don't need to know the difference between an S3 or S4. They happen at different parts of the diastolic cycle. It's way too hard. But if you hear that the patient has an S3 or S4 sound, I want you to know that means the patient has heart failure. Okay? S3, S4s mean you're hearing a gurgle or rumble all over the heart, and that means they have heart failure. If you hear it over one spot, it means they have a valve problem, and the spot you're hearing it on is the valve involved. A friction rub is a scratchy sound. It really hears, if you want to know what it sounds like, rub your fingers next to your ears. That scritchy, scritchy, scritchy sound you hear, that's what you hear under your stethoscope, and it's heard over multiple areas. So this one's multiple spots too. 
Diastolic gallops, the S3, S4, are murmurs over multiple areas, but it's murmurs of heart failure. It's not valve murmurs, heart failure, S3, S4. Friction rubs are inflammation. Friction rubs are inflammation in multiple spots. The diastolic gallop is murmurs in multiple spots. The stenosis and regurgitation are murmurs in one spot. Okay? They're all murmurs. All of them. I love the sound of murmurs. Okay. Let's clear all that trash off of there. So, what are we listening to? Well, remember we went back, and if you don't remember, go back to the first slide. When you are ending diastole, you hear lub, right? So let's go back. Remember, we were talking about this one. We were talking about the P waves. Let's go back. Remember, P waves, this is atrial conduction. This is atrial contraction. This is... Lub. And what did lub mean? Well, 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 let's just keep going. Well, this is lub. Then we have ventricular conduction. And then this is ventricular contraction. And then we had, oops, dub. And when we do it again, at the end of this will be another P and then another QRS. And so this would be lub again. So what we are seeing is this is all of diastole in between after the ventricle contracts and we have dub. So this is lub. Again. So from dub to lub is diastole, and from lub to dub is systole. So this would be a T wave and then a QRS. So that would be the same thing. So this is what we have going on here. Diastole, systole. Lub is the end of diastole. Lub is the end of diastole. What valves close here? When the atrium is done, this is diastole filling, and this is systole ejecting. Diastole filling. So we have lub. We're done filling. The AV valves shut because the outflow valves need to open. And then we eject out, and then the outflow valves shut. So, lub is the AV valve shutting, and dub is the outflow valve shutting. So when we have lub again, that's the AV valve, and we just go through this over and over and over again. Lub, dub, lub, dub. So, what we hear then is, Lub dub, lub dub. When we hear a sound in between those sounds, so if this is lub and this is dub, where do we hear the whoosh? That's what we're listening for. If we hear lub woosh dub, lub woosh dub, lub woosh dub, where is this noise happening? Lub woosh dub, lub woosh dub. That's a systolic murmur because the woof is the sound of the murmur. La woof dub, la woof dub, systolic murmur. If you hear lub dub woof, lub dub woof, that is a diastolic murmur. So when you are listening, and I'm not going to make you listen, don't know about NCLEX. But when you're listening, and you can go on YouTube and listen to a whole bunch of murmurs, but really what you're listening for is the lup-dup, lup-dup, lup-dup. 
and you're going to hear something that sounds like whoop, like a bubble or something weird. That's systolic because you can hear something in between lubbed up. If you hear lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, that's a diastolic murmur. It's after the dub, it's during diastole, right before lub, which is the end of diastole. So hopefully you can see that. I will tell you on the exam questions, and we have a few extras, um, which if it's a systolic or diastolic murmur, it is important that you know what is open during systole and diastole so that you can tell whether it's regurgitation or stenosis. It's great. This is so great. You're going to be magical. You're going to impress everybody. All right. So the first thing is, when do you hear it? I will tell you that. The second thing, where do you hear it? When you're listening to the heart, you're going to listen in five places. If you're ever doing a cardiac assessment, you're listening in five places. You're listening on your... Oh, I don't want to be blue. Let's listen. Let's do... What color is it going to be? Let's be black. Um, you're going to listen right here on the right side of your chest. So put your hand on your right side. This is the right side of your chest. There's only one listening spot on the right side. And it's at the second intercostal space. So right below, you got your little, not, your little clavicle notch about two fingers width below or two or three fingers width. Two fingers width and over to the right. Two fingers width below your clavicle notch. Um, and over to the right, put your stethoscope there. That is your the spot of your aortic valve. We're not gonna we're not gonna talk about the fact that it's not anatomically correct. It is anatomically correct. Our drawings are not anatomically correct. A lot of people think that the right side should be the right side of the heart, and that the left side of the chest. So the right side of the heart should be the right the right side of the chest should be the right side of the heart. And the left side of the chest to be the left side of the heart. So a lot of people don't like the fact that the aortic valve, which is on the left side of the heart, is on the right side of the chest. But the problem is the heart is twisted in the chest, and that's where the aorta comes out of the left ventricle. I can't do it. I can't make this right. But um, that does confuse people who haven't understood uh, the anatomy of the heart. But study these spots and get them right because there will be a couple of questions on the exam about how to tell which spot they're in, like what valve is the problem. So when you're listening on the right side of the chest, that second intercostal space, that's the aortic, car the aortic valve. But what you're going to listen to is um, everybody uses the ape to man monomic that the A is the first spot you listen to. So the first spot is the right intercostal space, the right side of the sternum, second intercostal space. Then you move the stethoscope over to the left side of the sternum, same latitude, same area, second intercostal space, and listen there. We're listening to the pulmonic valve. So if there are no problems, you're just hearing lub-dub, lub-dub in all these spots. Then we move down one finger's width to the third intercostal space, and that is Herb's point. That's the best spot to hear. If you're going to listen to one spot and one spot only, it's usually Herb's point, which is where you're used to listening to heart sounds. Um, Herb's point is the best spot to hear S1, S2, but it's not the best spot to hear all your valves. So Herb's point we don't really use as a cardiac nurse, but it's right there and it's in ape to man. So it's the third spot is Herb's point. Go down one more finger's width to the fourth intercostal space. Um, and that is your tricuspid space. That's your tricuspid valve that we are listening to. Even though it's on the left side of your sternum, it still is the right side of your heart. It's confusing. It does not match. Just accept this and move on. Um, the tricuspid is your fourth intercostal space. Um, it's right to the, of the left of the sternum. So as you go down the left side, you're listening to the second intercostal space, third intercostal space, fourth intercostal space, and then you're going to move over to your left to the fifth intercostal. So down one finger and over to the midclavicular line between the middle, between your sternum and your shoulder, the midclavicular line, the middle of your clavicle. 
So you're going to go down one finger's width and over to the middle, which is right under, right under boobs on men and women. Um, the fourth intercostal space on the left of the sternum is usually right to the side of boobs and men and women. Um, and that's where you're going to listen to the mitral valve. And so if you march that out, right second, left second, left third, left fourth, and then midclavicular fifth, you've got all five spots. Name those spots as you march them. Start in the right on the second intercostal space, A, P, T, E, M. So as you move around, A, P, E, T, M. I've watched so many students move their their fingers around during the test, and it makes me so happy that they're thinking. But A stands for aortic, P stands for pulmonary, E stands for herbs point, T stands for tricuspid, and M stands for mitral. If you are listening to all five spots and you heard something weird in one spot, let's say you heard it on the left of your sternum, on the second intercostal space, you heard la dub la dub la dub Then when you moved down, you heard la dub la dub You didn't hear the woo. You didn't hear it on any other spaces. You only heard it to the left of the sternum on the second intercostal space. It's a pulmonic murmur. You can be happy that you just got that far. Good for you. You only heard it in one spot. It's a murmur over that valve of that spot. Um, you can go in more depth and you can ask, what was that valve doing when I heard the murmur? So the first stop is when did you hear it? So let's say we're in that second intercostal space left of the sternum, the pulmonary area, second intercostal space left of the sternum. We heard lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. What did we hear? Lub woof dub. We heard a systolic murmur. So we heard a systolic murmur. Where did we hear it? We heard it on the second intercostal space left of the sternum. We heard a systolic murmur left intercostal space left of the sternum. So we found left intercostal space left of the sternum. Oops back out. You can use this chart or you can memorize, but second intercostal space left of the sternum during systole is pulmonic stenosis. If you don't want to memorize a chart and you don't want to circle these charts or use these charts, you can laminate this and use it if you ever wanted to. Um, you would think to yourself, all right, it was during systole and it is the pulmonary valve. What does the pulmonary valve look like during systole? Is it closed or open? Pulmonary valve in systole. Is the pulmonary valve an outflow valve or an AV valve? It's outflow. So the pulmonary valve is an outflow valve. Is it open during systole or closed during systole? It's open. So if the valve is supposed to be open and we're hearing a weird sound, it's stenosis. That's the thinking through it way. Or you can memorize and circle until you get to know the areas. But I will tell you, you have half the game mastered if you um, just know that where it is. Because if you're given four choices on an exam and you know what part it is, so if I give you, let's say, these four choices on an exam, and you know you heard it over the second intercostal space left of the sternum, you would know that's the pulmonary region. You could get the answer right. So I will tell you that you probably have enough to get it um, on an exam if you hear it in all those spaces. So you hear, on every spot you listen to, it's a gallop. And you don't have to worry about the S3, S4. The fact that you heard a gallop, people, you'll be blowing people's mind. Um, but the S3, S4 are just differences in the, the blooping sound. Dear Lord, don't learn that. It's way too much. 
Never, never, never. And friction rub would be that you hear a scratchy sound under your stethoscope in all five areas. That would be a friction rub. So now you are an expert at reading hearts. If you aren't, then you could maybe take this and just use it as a laminated circle to guide. Um, but this is my key takeaway from this. Don't you just, I heard something weird, doc. I know where it was. I know where I heard it, but it was weird. They'll get an echo. You don't have to do anything about it. And this is me. Uh, yeah, I'm a cardiac nurse. Yeah, don't. I'm just going to tell you, if you know TP is on the right, Ma is on the left. Once you figure out what valve you heard was flubbing up and you know what side of the heart is on. So you know if it's a pulmonary problem, it's on the right side of the heart. You're going to have right heart failure cues. Just having them, asymptomatic cues, just having them is just a murmur. There is no usually any symptoms of a murmur, just the sound. Sound's the only symptom. Worsening cues will be sounds of either heart failure or dysrhythmia of the stretching of the, the, um, the involved atrium or ventricle around the involved valve. So worsening cues give you symptoms of valve disorders. Asymptomatic valve disorders just means you have a murmur. People live with murmurs all the time, and the doctor follows up on them, and they will only intervene on them when they have worsening cues. So if you know which valves are on the right and the left side of the heart, you can just go that worsening cues will be right and left heart failure cues. You've already studied all the valves. Valve interventions, if you don't have any cues or you just have the valve murmur, you will monitor key assessments, um, tell the patient to self-monitor your key cardiac assessments. They will probably be on anticoagulants if you have a murmur because anytime you have blood pooling or murmuring around or not being able to get out, anytime you have blood pooling, there's a risk of clots. So most murmur patients would get anticoagulants um, and yearly follow-ups. If they are having treatments um, or symptoms of heart failures, they would get treatment for heart failures, but they would also replace or repair the dysfunctional valve. So depending on what kind of procedure they have, whether they have it in the interventional rate cardiology or their cath lab suite, or whether they have an open valve repair will be the difference in the procedures that you will be monitoring for. We'll do that in the procedure section. Um, the big teaching difference on valves is if they get a valve replacement, if they have a tissue valve, which could be a human or um, porcine, I think they have bovine, um, synthetic. All of these are um, tissue valves, and they will last about 10 to 20 years. They do not require anticoagulant therapy. Um, it's a great option for older patients. Now, if I was 50 and had my valve replaced and it was going to last 10 to 20 years, I don't know if I'd want to have another cardiac procedure in 10 to 20 years. I might go with the longer lasting uh, mechanical valve. The mechanical valve can last for a lifetime, but the problem is, is it's not um, tissue. So it causes um, inflammation. and clotting. So the patient will be on lifelong anticoagulants. This is not a good choice for patients that are um, have an anticoagulant contraindication. If you're contraindicated to anticoagulants, you'll be probably getting a tissue valve. Um, they also have a mechanical click after surgery. So you will hear um, lub click, lub click, lub click, or click, lub click, dub click, dub, depending on which valve was replaced. Little break if you want. Otherwise, we're going into endocarditis. This is an infection of the inner lining. Remember the endo lining, the valve lining, the inner blood lining of the heart. So an infection of this lining of the heart, you can imagine, um, could be problematic because it includes the valves. Um, most infective endocarditis are bacterial. Um, those bacterial infections cause a high fever. Why do you think you'd have chest pain? I mean, you have bacteria growing on your valves 
and in your bloodstreams and on your aorta, um, it's going to cause a little bit of chest pain, especially if there's bacteria on your endocardium and those bacteria are irritating your muscle there, it's going to cause chest pain. Um, large knee joints is just because this is symptoms of a bloodstream infection. And honestly, anything that's infecting the inner layer where your blood is rushing past, all the blood is rushing past. Can you imagine blood rushing past this bacteria? You're going to have a bloodstream infection. It's just going to happen. So the rest of these are more along the lines of um, symptoms of the bloodstream infection. High fever, chest pain, bloodstream infection. Um, they will have, if they're worsening cues, one of the things that we really, really worry about with endocarditis is the fact that these bacterial colonies are growing on the inside of the heart and they can um, get dislodged and be carried into the body. So these little bacterial colonies are called um, Aschoff's bodies. They're vegetation nodules and they can also damage the heart valves. So they can actually deform the heart valves and they can cause um, stenosis or regurgitation in the valves by scar the scarring either not allowing the valve to open right or the scarring leaving the valve unable to close properly, um, and that valve disease could cause heart failure. But we are always watching endocarditis for symptoms of valve failure. We're also watching for those little bacterial colonies getting off and causing, um, they're called bacterial emboli. They can cause tissue ostemia. They get stuck in other organs. Um, but also they can have bloodstream infection is sepsis. It's almost a guarantee. So these, um, these vegetations are breaking off and causing bloodstream infections. So your expected cues are going to be infection. And it's going to be infection of the heart lining, and it's going to be infection of the blood. Um, the key assessments are going to be, if we're listening for valve disorders, we're going to be listening our all areas for the presence of new or worsening murmurs. Because as these vegetations cause scar tissue here, this valve could get stuck in a stenosed spot. It won't close right, and it won't allow blood fully out. Listening for lung sounds in case of heart failure symptoms. These are heart failure symptoms. And then we would also be looking for possible vegetative emboli. They could cause strokes if they're coming out of the left heart. They can cause pulmonary embolus if they're coming out of the right heart. They can cause tissue and end organ schebia if they're getting into the aorta. It's real simple to treat endocarditis blood cultures to figure out what it is and give antibiotics. Ding, ding, ding. I mean, this isn't rocket science, guys. It's an infection. Blood cultures, antibiotics. Um, if there is cardiac inflammation or joint inflammation, it's inflammation. It is pain. Morphine's great. But inflammation, non-steroidals and steroids are the best for inflammation. Non-steroidals, there is a strong dose. It's called Ketorolac. It's Toradol. Um, but it does have all the same and, in fact, just as bad um, side effects as um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but five times the dose. So if you can't take a non-steroidal, then um, they would do a morphine. But really, non-steroidals and steroids, even though they're not as powerful, are better for an endocarditis. Um, I'll let you play lasagna or endocarditis. I'll give you the answer in the comments. All right. Um, the, one of the big things about endocarditis is that it is related to the most common, most common cause. The number one cause is rheumatic fever, which is streptococcus. So number one cause of rheumatic is of um, endocarditis is streptococcus. The number two cause of endocarditis is drug abuse. So teaching and communicating to prevent those things would be helpful. Um, if it is due to streptococcus, they will need their entire course of antibiotic therapy. Um, and this is just for teaching for after endocarditis. After endocarditis, they will be very careful because they once they've had endocarditis, they're at risk for having endocarditis more often. They will need prophylactic antibiotics 
prior to any invasive surgery, they will need prophylactic antibiotics. The difference is how long. If there was no valve disease during their endocarditis, no valve disease during this endocarditis, then they can do prophylaxis for five years. If they had valve disease with this endocarditis, they will have to have five lifelong prophylaxis. This is just because if your valve was damaged so badly by endocarditis the first time, you had better never get it again. Um, and you are more prone to getting endocarditis after you've had it once. Aortic dissection is our last disorder of the endocardium because this is the aorta leaving the heart up here. Um, the, the lining, this is, again, this is the aortic valve. That lining does continue in the aorta. And if that lining gets broken, we have something called an aneurysm, the balloon-like bulge in the artery. Um, these aneurysms can cause the layers of the artery wall to separate. So we have our inner lining and our outer lining here. Um, it can cause a dissection, which is blood flow actually coming into the inner lining of the wall. So the aneurysm is the bulge. Um, and this is how atherosclerosis can cause aneurysms. Um, but this is a problem of the inner lining of the wall of the vessel. And dissection is where the blood flow actually flows between the walls of the vessel and can cause a complete rupture. So we will cause existing cues just having an aneurysm. Worsening cues is having a dissection and the worsening, worsening, deadly cue is rupture. Because once your aorta ruptures, you only have about four beats, um, maybe, maybe more. Maybe you have like a minute's worth of beats before you lose all your blood volume into your chest. So, um, or your belly. Thoracic and abdominal aneurysms, once they rupture, um, you're dead. So that's a pretty worsening cue. So we're really going to be talking about existing cues means you have an aneurysm. And a worsening cue means that aneurysm has turned into a dissection. This is probably what I would like to highlight for the difference. Here's your aorta. Here's your inner lining or your endo lining. I guess I should make this black so it's a different color. This is your endo lining. This is why it's an endocardial, endocardium disorder. But here's your inner lining. If your inner lining gets damaged, then here's the damaged part. You can get blood flow or dissection into the lining between. Now, if your aortic blood flow starts flowing here, well, you can see how that would split all the way down. And then you only have one lining to fail before you have ruptured your aorta. Pretty bad set of circumstances. So once these things become worsening cues, they need to be intervened immediately. Um, existing, if you have a thoracic aneurysm and the difference between a thoracic aneurysm and an abdominal aneurysm, is if it's above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm. If it is, the aneurysm is above the diaphragm, it's a thoracic aneurysm. If it's below the diaphragm, it's an abdominal aneurysm. Um, so if it's a thoracic aneurysm, the only problem would be maybe trouble swallowing or shortness of breath because where would the aneurysm be blocking your lungs expanding, or your esophagus actually goes down this way too. So you might have trouble swallowing because you have an aneurysm in the way. So trouble swallowing, mild shortness of breath, either that or um, they may be found it on a chest x-ray. Um, the worsening cues are dissection, which is intense and persistent chest and upper back pain. So they're probably in the hospital anyway with this intense and persistent chest pain. But hypotension, decreased perfusion because the dissection, dissected blood doesn't ever get delivered to the body. So even if it hasn't ruptured and it is just dissecting, then that blood that has dissected, this blood right here, is not getting to the body. So you will have hypotension. Um, and then... You, once you have this pain, it's an emergency. It's like really bad emergency. So if your patient has a history of an aneurysm and starts complaining of chest pain, um, that's a problem. If it is an abdominal aneurysm, 
they are usually asymptomatic as well. Very, very skinny people. You might have pulsation. That does not mean you have an aneurysm, and it doesn't mean it's, it's pretty much not a, you might notice it. Um, basically, they are asymptomatic. They are usually caught on chest x-rays or um, MRIs or just incidental findings. Um, they are usually not symptomatic until they are dissecting, and that cue is very, very terrible, almost labor-like abdomen and lower flank back pain. Terrible, terrible, unrelenting back pain. Because remember, this is dissecting. It's just dissecting below the diaphragm, so you're going to feel it in the abdominal area. And the, for the same reason, hypotension. Decreases. So those are the aneurysms for the key assessments. Because the dissecting will decrease if you keep the pressure lower. If you are dissecting, so if this is dissecting here, I should copy this picture and move it to the slide. But if I could take this picture and move it to the other slide, I would. But think about the pressures here. If you have high pressure, it's going to force a lot more blood flow. If you have lower pressure, it's just going to dribble. You're not going to fix it, but you're just going to decrease the pressure in the system and stop making the problem worse. So the key point is your blood pressure. Pain level and location, because that will tell us if the dissection is getting worse. The worse the pain, the worse the dissection. They can check the size of the aneurysm. Um, if they need to, if they're just monitoring it, you knew about it incidentally and they're monitoring it, they can do serial monitoring of the size of the aneurysm. The treatments lower the BP because then we will decrease the dissection until you can at least get an intervention done. This is done with antihypertensives, vasodilators, direct vasodilators. Um, it does prevent a dissection if they have a large aneurysm. Um, if they are dissection, it prevents rupture. Um, it shrinks and allows for healing. Low BP. Even if it's an incidental finding, now they have a very important reason to keep their blood pressure down because it will keep it from dissecting. Once it's dissecting, then we're trying to avoid rupture. We will keep it down even further. I had a patient that was not a surgical candidate for, she had a uh, aortic aneurysm and she was having back pain. And, um, the doctor said she's not a surgical candidate. Um, she won't come off the table if we do the aortic surgery because look at the aortic surgery, guys. It's, it's huge. You have to clamp the aorta on both sides, go on heart-lung bypass. They actually cut the aorta apart. And then, scariest of scary, your entire blood flow is now dependent on those sutures holding. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. It's going to come back to you. Um, I had a patient that basically wasn't a surgical candidate because she couldn't have this big interventional surgery done. And um, they said, just keep her blood pressure um, as low as we can so that she is asymptomatic. And we will hope that it will allow healing of the aneurysm. So um, they said to basically titrate her vasodilator. She was on IV vasodilators. She was on... Um, I think it was IV uh, hydralazine, but she was on um, vasodilators to keep her blood pressure low, and the order was to titrate to back pain. So basically, we were to keep the blood pressure low enough to keep her back pain away, because if her back pain came back, um, we were going to have to up the dose of vasodilator to keep her blood pressure low. Um, her, blood, her back pain only went away when her blood pressure was uh, less than 85 so I had to keep this poor woman in bed with a blood pressure less than 85 because if she turned, moved, coughed, her blood pressure would go up to like the 90s, 100s, and she would have back pain. And that meant that she was dissecting again. So, um, yeah, she stayed like that for 24 hours, um, 48 hours, and then we could slowly raise her blood pressure higher and higher each day as her uh, wall healed. Uh, so it did work. I mean, she had to stay on massive uh, blood pressure meds for the rest of her life. But um, lower blood pressure is the aortic aneurysm uh, intervention. Uh, surgery is um, done if it's necessary, if they have worsening cues, or if it's larger than um, five centimeters around. Uh, it's a higher risk for rupture. 
Uh, you can read the teaching. And we will take a break for a pair of credits. Faster and faster as we go through here. Uh, so we're going to... Oh, sorry, my last recording just just added in. Uh, we're going to get faster and faster as we go through here to get finished up with this. Pericarditis is our last um, set of... Um, this is our last lining of the heart. We talked about the inside lining, endocarditis. We talked about the muscle, myocardial problems. And now we're talking about the pericardium, the outside sac of the heart. Um, pericarditis is an infection of this outside sac of the heart. So imagine we get a bacterial infection in here. What do you think we are going to have? This is infection. So this is gonna rub on the heart tissue here. You're going to have pain. You're going to have pain. It's going to be sharp, but it's going to be pleuritic. It's going to be pleuritic because it's going to hurt whenever the lungs hit up against it. So actually, here's the, I'm drawing a <laughs> drawing an infected heart. Let's just have an infected heart. So you can imagine every time this infection brushes up against here, it's going to cause pain on the chest. And then every time the lung hits it, when it inflates, that's going to cause pain too. So sharp and pleuritic chest pain, worse with deep inspiration, and when laying flat, because now we got this big heavy heart laying on a whole bunch of things. Um, it's aggravated by coughing, deep breathing, as you can imagine. Um, and it's relieved by leaning forward, because you really, when you're leaning forward, this is my excellent person leaning forward. If he had a little heart hanging, it would hang instead of laying back against his spine and his lungs. It would actually kind of relieve it and let it dangle. And um, it kind of, I'm just going to delete those pictures. Um, yeah, it just makes the heart feel better to lean forward. Um, get off that, dear Lord. Just trying to clear the pin markings. Okay. Um, because it's an infection of the lining of the heart, it is usually a low-grade fever because it's not in the bloodstream. Um, it will be cause ST elevation in all leads because all of this conduction area is elevated and irritated. So it will cause ST elevation in all leads and chest pain, but it is not a heart attack. Um, it does cause a friction rub on auscultation because this irritated lining here um, causes, um, you can't hear through it all this fluid and infection, and it causes that rubbing sound underneath your stethoscope. So you'll hear it in all the fields all around the heart. The worsening cues of this is this thing swelling to the point that it compresses the heart and causes squeeze on the heart, because what will happen if your heart squeezes it will, and that's called tamponade. Tamponade is a fancy word for squeezing the heart. How will we know we have tamponade? You'll hear muffled heart sounds because all you're going to be hearing, you're trying to hear through a lot of fluid and inflammation, so you have muffled heart sounds. This narrowing pulse pressure and pulses paradoxus, this means that with each beat, that the pressure releases with each beat. Um, so basically your pulse will look like this if you have an arterial line. That's very late signs though. And narrowing pulse pressure means that your blood pressure is dropping, but your diastolic is going up. Um, your blood pressure drops down, you could say 80 over 70. That would be a narrowing pulse pressure. Um, you'll have large amounts of inflammatory fluid, blood in the pericardium, or scarred thick pericardium. You will only see that on an echo. Um, you will have signs in left, right, and left heart failure. Pericarditis, we will get an EKG. They will see this ST elevation in all leads. Once they see it in all leads, they know it's not a heart attack. It's inflammation all around the heart. It's not in a specific area causing... Um, it's not a heart attack when it's in all leads. Um, you will be looking at the pain level. The heart sounds will be a friction rub. You'll be looking for signs of perfusion because we are checking to make sure there's no tamponade or problems. Here's a good picture of the pressure of the fluid on the, on the heart there. can cause squeeze if it gets too big. So our interventions, because it's inflammation of the lining, we're going to reduce swelling and inflammation. And how do we do that? We do that with anti-inflammatory medications. 
Um, the patients are having pain, so we are going to keep the head of the bed elevated because they do feel better when they are sitting upright and leaning forward. Um, so keep that head of the bed upright so they can put a little bedside table there so they can lean on it um, because they do feel better tripoding. Um, if they have worsening symptoms or they have symptoms of squeeze on the chest, they can do an emergency procedure where they go in and they will pull fluid out of the pericardium. You can imagine the complications that would ensue with that. Um, they can do a needle removal of fluid. They can actually cut a piece of the pericardial sac open and let it drain. And if it drains into the thoracic space, what do you think would... Uh, might have a little tube there to drain that stuff out, chest tube. Um, so they could do a pericardial window or they could actually remove pericardium. But these are all only surgical procedures that they will do if there are worsening symptoms. Um, teach and communicate, basically, these are the common causes of getting pericarditis. Um, pain will decrease with time. It's not dangerous or life-threatening. Hard for someone with chest pain to comprehend. You might have to say that quite a few times. Um, Use anti-inflammatories and rest to control chest pain because it's not having a heart attack. It's irritation of the heart muscle due the to last pressure. thing we are going to go through are the cardiac procedures. Again, most of the interventions that are surgical or um, interventional are done in two places. Interventional cardiology, which is also known as the cath lab, and open heart, the way we think about it, is uh, cardiac surgery. So interventional cardiac, interventional cardiology, again, this is going to be about the procedure percutaneous coronary intervention. Um, one of the things they can do is cardiac catheterization. You can do those diagnostically um, to open vessels or put in stents. So this is the balloon at the end of the catheter. And anything interventional cardiology or um, percutaneous coronary intervention, that means through the skin, percutaneous, means through the skin. And this is a through the skin coronary intervention. But percutaneous means they just puncture a hole in your groin and um, feed a long catheter through the groin up into the heart where they can then go into the coronary arteries through the, um, through the aorta and get into the coronary sinus and into the coronary arteries. And they can actually um, do all these interventions. Oops. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to draw through there. But um, this is actually one of the most amazing things. This is a, a coronary artery obstruction right there. And then after, they reperfuse it. So this is like basically the, the artery that is completely occluded. And then they open it. It's just amazing to see. So you can um, just do diagnosis to see, you know, what's going on in the coronary arteries. You can open coronary artery vessels. You can place cardiac vessel stents, which reperfuse the heart after um, an MI. And then you can also do other repair procedures percutaneously because these things are, um, they have all kinds of things that you can deploy on the end of these catheters. Um, they can close heart wall defects. They can um, cut and ablate any, um, any aneurysms. They can remove hypertrophic cardiac muscle. These appendages, these are atrial appendages that sometimes have extra SA node tissue and cause atrial fibrillation. So they can go in there and um, tap those things up, put a wire around them and get rid of appendages. Um, they can put in pacemakers. They can even deploy valves um, onto valve stems. So if your patient has had percutaneous cardiac intervention, which means they are putting a catheter through a vein or an artery, after this procedure, uh, they can have some chest pain. If they had it for um, an MI, they can have this reperfusion chest pain when they restore blood flow to the rest of the heart. The tissue that was dying is now getting oxygenated and is releasing all the lactic acid that it made while it was lacking oxygen. And so they have some kind of, they have chest pain, but it is different. It's mild. It's not as pressure. Um, it is intermittent, and it's actually not nearly as severe. Patients that have just gone through an MI know what their MI pain feels like. This reperfusion chest pain feels more like a burning pain, um, kind of like when you wake up after, um, if you you know, your leg goes to sleep or your arm goes to sleep and you wake up and you have those pins and needles afterwards, that's sort of what reperfusion chest pain feels like.
Um, arrhythmias um, due to the irritability and reperfusion after cardiac um, intervention is not that surprising to have a few arrhythmias. You will monitor them and treat them if they are symptomatic. Um, so when these sites, when you pull these catheters out, they will come out either with a vascular closure device or an access site puncture. So when they come out, let me see if I have a picture. So here, when they come out with the femoral um, dressings, these are things that they can use to close. So when they put that catheter and a suture through, or they put that catheter um, into the femoral artery there, when they pull it out, it's gonna leave a hole in the artery and you don't wanna leave a hole in an artery because it will bleed. So we need to do something to, if they take it out, they will put a vascular closure device. You don't have to know these kinds and the names, but if they have a vascular closure device, what I want you to remember is that even though the site may look small and intact, we are always making sure to assess for bleeding because any of these closure devices could fail and that hole is still not healed yet. It will take about three days um, for it to fully start healing. So um, in that time, we need to monitor those sites. So you can have a vascular closure device or they will still have the catheter in place that maybe will be removed on the floor and then you will have to hold pressure after they remove that catheter. Sometimes they will give patients um, uh, anticoagulants in the cath lab and it's not safe to remove the sheath that they use to insert the catheter and do the procedure. So they will send them out with an access site. Um, so there are a couple of things you will see after a cath lab, but no matter how you see the access site, whether it's just got a clear dressing on it because it had a vascular closure device or whether it's got a sheath coming out of it with a, um, with a, you know, a monitoring device, we're still going to be monitoring that site for at least six to 12 hours after um, the cath. So we're looking for hematoma because if that site starts to bleeding, uh, you know, even if it's under the skin, the damage is you may not see the bleeding on the surface. The bleeding will come from this hole in the femoral and could bleed internally. So we're always going to be looking at the site, but you may or may not see a hematoma, which is a collection of blood right under the skin. If it is a femoral site, you are at risk for retroperitoneal bleed. If that femoral site starts to ooze and bleed, blood will drain into the abdominal space. You will see that by decreased blood pressure and back and flank pain because the fluid is collecting into the peritoneal space. So it will give back and flank pain. Um, you are also putting um, a catheter right around, let me see, you're putting a catheter right into the heart space and into the coronary arteries. I don't think it shows fully, but it's going in through the coronary arteries here. And you could um, rupture a coronary artery. Those coronary arteries are on the outside of the heart. So if they start to bleed, there's a peritoneal sac there. If it starts to bleed, if a coronary artery starts to bleed, where is all that blood going to collect? Where would a coronary artery bleed collect? In the pericardial cavity, which means that if they have a pericardial, oops, I don't know why sometimes it does that. But if they have a pericardial um, bleed, they could have that cardiac tamponade, which means something squeezing the heart. So this is, you know, if we have a heart in there and there's coronary arteries on the front and they did a percutaneous cath and it started to bleed, it will fill up the sac all around the heart and could cause squishing of the heart. So we would hear those muffled heart sounds, right and left heart failure, the narrowed pulse pressures, pulses paradoxus. So we're looking for hematomas and bleeds we may not see a hematoma before a bleed, so don't think if there's no hematoma, there's no retroperitoneal bleed. That's not true. We're looking for signs of cardiac tamponade if the coronary arteries were intervened with, and then if the coronary arteries were intervened, we're looking for vasospasm of those vessels, which will cause chest pain. So those are the things that you would need to report to your physician, and those are the not expected complications of PCI. Um, for monitoring, 
This is, of course, EKG oxygen perfusion, um, pain level and location, but we are adding on the procedure access site. So if those sheaths, those IV lines are left in place, they need to monitor, they were left in place because the patient was anticoagulated. So you need to be able to monitor according to your hospital's policy, whatever clotting times they wanna monitor until it's safe to remove. And then if you're removing it, they need manual deep pressure for 20 minutes and you should be trained on sheath removal. But I do want you to know that you need to make sure that you are monitoring the access site. And after the access site, whether it's one of these closure devices or whether you have pulled the sheath um, or someone has pulled the sheath, you need to make sure that the accessed extremity doesn't bend for six hours afterwards to preserve the clot. So these are some manual, these are some non-manual pressure devices that can be held. This is a TR band for a radial site. It's just a little, has a little balloon that puts pressure right on the site and you release the pressure slowly over time by deflating this little balloon um, a milliliter at a time. And there is a policy on how to deflate a TR band. This will hold pressure over a radial artery if they did the cath through the arteries of the hand. This is a, um, I'm not a big fan of it, but this is a femstop or a groin uh, pressure. These are not the best because these are supposed to put pressure right on the femoral site and um, it has a balloon just like these TR bands and should hold pressure right on the femoral site. But I will tell you, it only works on skinny people where you can tell where the femoral site is. And these um, slip out of place very easily and the patient could bleed anyway. I don't, we don't, some places don't even let you use them. But after you have worked that hard to get a um, clot on the artery that was accessed, you don't want them bending or moving or um, dislodging that clot because then they're at risk of bleeding again. So we really do keep that extremity from um, bending for at least six hours afterwards. If it was groin access, they'll be on bed out six hours and then they will have a splint for six hours of radial or brachial access just to keep it from bending. And then of course, you're always checking the extremity below the access site every hour for at least eight hours afterwards to make sure that um, we have not dislodge the clot or, or had any bleeding. Um, you also want to appear, you know, look at the site, the site, the extremity, and the um, keeping that sheath site or access site straight for six hours afterwards. So that is kind of PCI post-care. Uh, complications. There are some interventions for if they have complications, but you will notify the physician of any complications. But if there's a hematoma or a bleed, you will have someone else call the physician while you hold manual pressure. Um, open heart surgery. Again, this is not to make you an expert in open heart surgery. Um, in fact, this is just really in case you... Um, see an open heart surgery patient. There's a lot more to it. It's um, very delicate, mostly because there's a lot of um, inflammation after cardiac surgery and the heart does not work efficiently right after cardiac surgery. So there is a lot of delicate tweaking of vasopressors, vasodilators, fluids, non-fluids, depending on what's going on in the heart. But what we are really looking for, of course, you're always worried after surgery from bleeding, you're worried about cardiac tamponade, which is um, bleeding into the pericardial sac. You're looking for vasospasm if it was a uh, coronary artery intervention, like a coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, but any bleeding from the heart will cause tamponade. So we want to make sure that there is no bleeding or tamponade. There's no vasospasm infection in the 24, 48 hours after surgery. Renal failure, just because the heart, the bypass pump is not very good for the kidneys and the non-pulsatile flow of the bypass pump can cause the kidneys to have trouble. So we're always watching the kidney numbers after heart surgery. And if it was heart transplantation, we would add on looking for rejection. Um, and again, this is not to make you an open heart surgery nurse, but just for the expected things we would expect, or if you're taking care of a patient two or three days afterwards, patients need to be resting and clustering patient care. Um, they will have fluctuating blood pressures for 12 hours, but 
um, you won't be taking care of them in the 12 hours post um, nursing for a while, but you will see them after um, in clinical and then for a couple of days afterwards if you're working on the telemetry floors. Um, atelectasis, just because the hours on the bypass pump do cause the lungs to uh, not be inflated fully, so they will have atelectasis after surgery. They will have arrhythmias and heart blocks because of the swelling and inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and pain, pain medicines round the clock. They will also have chest tubes, but we're going to discuss chest tubes in the respiratory lecture. Cardiac, uh, you know, bleeding and tamponade. Bleeding leads to tamponade. The same sorts of infections after um, uh, the same sorts of complications. And again, really all I am looking for is that you know the expected versus the unexpected complications. Um, and then we have left the pharmacology. I am not going to go slide by slide on the pharmacology. This is more really for your resource and your med cards if you make them. What I want you to know is what inotropes mean. They increase contractility. What vasodilators do, they decrease the blood pressure and decrease the preload. Vasoconstrictors, they're also called vasopressors, increase blood pressure. And dysrhythmia control are your antiarrhythmics. I would like you to know each class. I would like you to recognize the medications for each class. So DIG, dopamine, dobutamine, and milrinone, these are your inotropes. Your vasodilators are going to be your calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. And then we have some direct vasodilators like nitroglycerin and um, nifedipine. And then we have vasoconstrictors and dysrhythmics. Now, I don't need you to memorize the doses of these. I would like you to recognize that if you see a medicine listed for a MAR, you recognize what class of medication it is. Um, this is more the you will have dig toxicity on the test. We had a slide on dig toxicity, but these are basically med cards. Um, if you can do anything, it's this slide. I would like you to know all the categories in two, three, four. These are all the critical care meds, guys. There's not a lot more except sedative meds that we would give a patient. But I want you to know inotropes, vasodilators, vasoconstrictors, and the antiarrhythmics. That's just all those meds that are in those categories and um, what you would use them for. Inotropes, contractility, vasodilators, preload, vasoconstrictors, afterload, and dysrhythmia for arrhythmias. So we can go through all these. You do not need to know all this for the test. These are more for your med cards and for understanding when you are in critical care. But I would like you to know that dopamine is an inotrope. And so if you see a patient on dopamine, they should be doing something for their cardiac contractility. Dibutamine the same way, milrinone the same way. We are trying to help the heart squeeze better to increase perfusion. Vasodilators, we are decreasing the blood pro or decreasing the afterload. And the direct vasodilators, maybe you recognize these. These are just, that's all they do. They're not calcium channel blockers. They're not ACE inhibitors. They're not ARBs. They don't fit into any category other than they actually directly vasodilate your blood pressure, your um, arteries. So those are our vasodilators that we will use. And then you have your vasoconstrictors, which are also called vasopressors. I'm not really sure why, but vasoconstrictors, it's just better to use the terms that describe them, vasodilators, vasoconstrictors. Um, and these are the most common. So if you recognize the names and you will need to study the dysrhythmia that controls because they're the interventions for the anti, for the arrhythmics. And then there's a little bit here about the continuous IV medication. I do show you how to do it dimensionally and how you do it desired over have. So there are a couple of examples here. If you have questions on those, let me know. Thank you for your attention and um, I will see you for the next lecture.